Though in the West, this conflict is often known as the Pacific War or the Pacific Theater of World War II, one of its major combatants, the Empire of Japan, knew this conflict by another name, Daito Senso, the Greater East Asian War. This name shows that the main aim of the invaders was not in the Pacific itself, but in the construction of a huge colonial empire over the whole of East Asia. Though their goal was the defeat of the Western colonial oppressors to give Asia to the Asians, their true desire was to become the sole overlords of the Orient. Soon the whole of Southeast Asia fell against the Japanese behemoth, and even though China continued to resist their advances, the Asian sphere was now under the control of the Empire of the Rising Sun. In the Pacific, however, a new war zone emerged, one that brought two giants on a collision course of destruction, death and misery. From Pearl Harbor to Australia, from Alaska to Midway, the Americans and their allies stood fast as they stymied the enemy advance eastwards. The myth of Japanese invincibility weighed heavy on their shoulders, but their resolve and tenacity would see them victorious in the end. Thus, join us as we cover the full detail of the war in the Pacific, from the smoke on the waters of Pearl Harbor to the fire in the sky over Midway. Many of the ships and battlefields we'll be talking about today have been brought back to life for you to enjoy by the sponsor of this video, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play naval combat game on PC that puts you at the helm of over 300 historic warships for use in fiery naval battles across a variety of beautiful seascapes, with dynamic weather to bring the realities of seafaring to bear against the struggle of warring ships and crews. Pilot battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers and even submarines, all lovingly modelled in full detail. And if you're into ships, the World of Warships community is the place for you, with a Discord and regular live streams and tournaments to show off craft and get them fighting in massive 12 vs 12 engagements. The game gets monthly updates with new ships, nations, cosmetics or ship classes, so there's always more to see, featuring crossovers with other franchises and real-life experimental ships that never saw battle until the simulations of today. We said this is on PC, but if you're on console, don't worry, as console versions are also available for free. So if you want to get a perfect mix of action and strategy on the battlefield, and a close look at loads of ships from the modern era, dive into World of Warships for free. Download the game at our link in the description, and after you register, use code WARSHIPS to grab a load of exclusive rewards right at the start. As we've seen in the previous episodes, the Japanese Empire had decided on war with the West since the embargo enacted by the US in July 1941. The plans to simultaneously execute invasions on the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines and Malaya, as well as a preemptive attack on Pearl Harbor to destroy the American Pacific Fleet, had all been drafted back in September, with preparations carried out successfully by late November. The United States, meanwhile, was also well aware that war was imminent, engaging in negotiations with Japan to delay this conflict as long as possible for their forces to adequately prepare. But on November 26th, the main Japanese strike force under Vice Admiral Nagumo Chuichi had already left its base heading to the Hawaiian Islands. Thus, time was running out for the United States. In Hawaii, the principal objective of the attack was Pearl Harbor, the main naval base for the Pacific Fleet of the US because of its geographical advantages, making it perfect for accommodating large warships and aircraft carriers. The Japanese planned to bombard these ships using dive bombers, high-altitude bombing and torpedo attacks, hoping that the destruction of these vessels would be enough to render the Pacific Fleet inoperative. That's why they didn't target the submarine base or the oil yard that were also present in Pearl Harbor. This attack was so important to get an early win in the war that the planners had gone to the extent of preparing mock-ups and models on which the pilots could practice maneuvers, so much so that thousands of hours of airtime were spent in charting out the perfect plan of attack, while the Type 91 torpedoes of the era were modified with wooden fins to be effective in shallow waters. Yet the plan of Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku also had some flaws. One is that Pearl Harbor was a naval base, so rescue services could be quickly mobilized and many sailors would be on shore leave, thus reducing the amount of possible American casualties. 
Another drawback was that the American ships were moored in shallow waters, so most of the destroyed vessels could be salvaged and repaired with comparative ease. But the most important disadvantage was that the three aircraft carriers of the Pacific Fleet were absent from Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack. This was something that the Japanese command knew, as many spies had already acquired detailed reports of all vessels and schedules at Pearl Harbor, but they decided to attack anyways, even though these carriers were one of the most important objectives of the operation. Meanwhile, in the American base, Major General Walter Short and Admiral Husband Kimmel were concerned about a possible attack on Pearl Harbor, believing that they could be subjected to a naval invasion or a sabotage operation. In that regard, all Army aircraft were bunched together for more protection at Wheeler Field, although this also made it an easier target for an air attack. Munitions were secured, coastal artillery was put on alert, carriers started to rotate in and out of harbour, and ships and naval aircraft started to patrol in search of submarine threats to shipping. As their preparations show, they were definitely not expecting an air attack. On December 2nd, while cruising onwards, Nagumo received orders to start the final preparations for the attack on Pearl Harbor, scheduled to commence five days later. Although the Japanese commander was worried that they might encounter American ships on their way, none came, and by December 7th, the Japanese task force had finally reached its destination. Pre-dawn, the operation began with Japanese midget submarines starting to stalk some American minesweepers that were on patrol, attempting to shadow their prey into the safety of the harbour while the anti-submarine net was open. Meanwhile, Nagumo ordered the first wave of aircraft to prepare for takeoff at 0615. Commanded by Fujita Mitsuo, the first 183 planes then steadily took off from their six aircraft carriers, some 250 miles north of Oahu. At 0630, they adopted V formation and headed southwest towards Pearl Harbor. A couple of minutes later, some Japanese submarines were discovered and one was sunk by the destroyer Ward in what would be the first shots of the Pacific War. Around 0700, a radar post on the Opana Ridge identified a group of more than 50 aircraft 132 miles north of Oahu and then notified headquarters, which didn't receive the message because the personnel had left for breakfast. At the same time, Nagumo ordered the 168 aircraft of the second wave to take off, commanded by Shimazaki Shigekazu. Commander Fujita then sighted the northern shore of Oahu at 0740, relieved to see no enemy aircraft in front, and subsequently ordered his pilots to deploy into attack formation at 0749. Because of a misunderstanding of his orders, both the dive bombers and the torpedo planes simultaneously commenced their operations. Wheeler Field, one of the main objectives due to the concentration of most of the American aircraft, was first systematically bombarded by the dive bombers and then repeatedly shredded with gunfire by A6M Zeros. Most of the planes were completely destroyed as a result, but 12 pilots managed to get their fighters to lift off and engage the Japanese in dogfights. Meanwhile, torpedo forces split into two strings, with 16 planes closing on their targets northwest of Ford Island, and with 24 planes going south to Hickam Field and Battleship Row, intending to attack enemy battleships and aircraft. Some 11 fighters also turned east to attack Kaneohe, arriving at 0753 and completely neutralizing the American aircraft there. At the same time, the Ewa Marine Air Corps Station came under attack by eight Zeros, leaving behind Wildcats blazing, scout bombers burning, and utility aircraft destroyed. Pearl Harbor itself was finally attacked at 0755, six minutes after the assault commenced and the Pacific Fleet would be caught unaware with a rude and violent awakening. As dive bombers started their bombardment over Hickam Field, torpedo planes nosed down on Pearl Harbor, leveling and dropping their deadly loads into the water. Northwest of Ford Island, the ex-battleship Utah and cruiser Raleigh reeled under torpedo explosions, while to the south of the island, 
the 1010 Pier experienced a slashing attack in which the cruiser Helena was hit. On battleship Roe, the battleship Oklahoma was the first one to get hit by torpedoes at 0757. At this point, alarms had been sounded and men started to pour from below decks to man the anti-aircraft guns. Soon after 0800, the Oklahoma received three more torpedo hits that left her capsizing, while the battleship Arizona was attacked with armor-piercing bombs that penetrated the deck and caused small fires. The repair ship Vestal nearby was also hit by these bombs, but it continued to fire against the Japanese planes even while engulfed in flames. And behind the Oklahoma, the battleship West Virginia was hit by two bombs that caused serious fires and by a total of seven torpedoes that opened two large holes and caused extreme damage. While on the other side, the battleship California was attacked by torpedo bombers that managed to hit her around 0805, tearing two huge holes that started flooding. As the Oklahoma capsized, Arizona was hit for a fourth time at 0806, piercing her forward magazine and causing such a powerful explosion that a fireball erupted from the ship, tearing her in half. Vestal's fires were suddenly extinguished due to the concussion, but oil from the ruptured tanks of the Arizona reignited the repair ship a couple of minutes later, forcing Commander Cassin Young to ground the Vestal. The West Virginia was also set on fire by fuel leaking from the destroyed Arizona, and she would end up sinking due to the damage. 429 men died that day in the Oklahoma, while the Arizona suffered 1,177 losses, including its two leading commanders. This was more than half of the total number of casualties the US would receive in this attack. At the same time, a recon squadron of SBDs coming from the aircraft carrier Enterprise, some 200 miles west of Oahu, arrived at the battle and was quickly engaged by the Japanese, but its efforts couldn't prevent their enemy from destroying half the aircraft at Hickam Field. Around 0810, one of the torpedo bombers managed to hit the battleship Nevada, causing minor flooding, but at the same time getting shot down by the American gunners. Ten minutes later, after some relentless bombardment and surrounded by the fires of the Arizona, the battleship Tennessee was hit by two bombs that luckily didn't cause serious damage, although fragments of the bombs were sent flying and ended up killing Captain Mervyn Benyon of the West Virginia. Around 0830, Japanese aircraft identified the remaining battleship, Pennsylvania, undergoing a refit at dry dock number one, and then started to bombard it for the next 15 minutes. Although one of the bombs caused large fires on the destroyers Cassin and Downs nearby, the Pennsylvania only got hit once and suffered no serious damage for it. At the same time, Shimazaki's second wave reached the coast of Oahu, but waited for the given command to attack, and at 0845, the California was struck by a bomb that started serious fires and caused considerable damage, although she continued to resist for the next few hours. While the Japanese planes made their last sorties with less intensity, the Nevada managed to control her flooding and then started to get away from the row. Around 0850, a momentary pause in the battering occurred as the second wave was ordered to commence its operations. Thus, over the Kulau Mountains, 78 dive bombers advanced directly towards Pearl Harbor, intending to continue the bombardment of the American vessels. Meanwhile, 18 bombers and 17 fighters attacked Kaneohe, and 27 bombers and some fighters took a wide sweep around the south of the mountains to attack Hickam Field. By 0900, the reign of death had resumed, but this time, the US forces were determined to offer more resistance. On Kaneohe, the bombers made strikes on the hangars and managed to explode one of them, while their Zeros continued farther south to Bellows Field, shredding with machine gun fire the enemy aircraft there. On Hickam, the Japanese resumed their bombardment over the field, but were met with considerable opposition, so they continued towards Iwar and Wheeler. The main attack also resumed over Battleship Row, hitting the battleship Maryland at 0908 and causing a small flood, although she would continue to fight for another day. Around 0920, Pennsylvania's dry dock was also hit again, 
finally exploding the destroyers there and causing severe damage to the battleship. But the strong American resistance forced the Japanese aircraft to target whatever ship they could, starting more attacks over cruisers and destroyers, and not over their real objectives. So in the end, the second wave would be much less successful than the first one because of this fierce opposition. Around 0950, however, the Nevada would be struck by five bombs as she steamed past the 1010 pier, thus suffering severe damage, although she would manage to safely return to shallow waters. The California would also succumb to its damage around 10, so her crew would have to abandon her and she would finally sink over the next three days. Commander Fujida would be the last aircraft to remain in Hawaii while he conducted his recon and assessment flight over Oahu, finally returning around 1100 hours. When he reached the aircraft carrier Akagi at 1300 hours, his report dissuaded Nagamo from ordering a third wave directed against American infrastructure like the submarine base or the oil yard. He decided this because they were running low on fuel and because they had lost the element of surprise but this would prove to be a very bad decision in the future. The operation, however, was considered a huge success in Japan, damaging or sinking all eight battleships, among other vessels, damaging or destroying 219 American aircraft, and causing 3,497 casualties on the US with only minimal losses. Consequently, the Japanese had acquired naval superiority in the Pacific, and could then continue with their plans of expansion. But before the smoke had drifted away in Hawaii, the American sleeping giant had awakened, ashamed and angered, and it wanted revenge. The Japanese war declaration had been scheduled to reach Washington before the attack on Pearl Harbor, but delays in the decodification and transcription of the message caused it to arrive one hour after the attack had commenced. The following day, FDR would then give his famous infamy speech taking the role of the innocent victim and targeting Japanese treachery to urge Congress to declare war on the Empire of Japan. Thus, the Pacific War had begun, as the Japanese were also launching a series of simultaneous invasions against British Malaya, Hong Kong, the Philippines and other islands under American control. As we've already seen, the United States had neglected the defences of its Pacific possessions for too many years since their victory in the Great War. And with the Japanese threat approaching like dark clouds on the horizon, the effort to prepare for a new war was still minimal, leading to a considerable weakness for the American forces in the Pacific. In July of 1941, after the Japanese occupation of southern Indochina, the USA FFE was formed, including both American and Filipino forces in the region, with Lieutenant General Douglas MacArthur as its commander-in-chief. The US Navy also had a small presence in the region with the old Asiatic fleet of Admiral Thomas Hart, which is not to be confused with the Pacific fleet based in Hawaii. This fleet depended on a few cruisers and World War I-era destroyers, although it featured a considerable submarine squadron as well, albeit not big enough to successfully struggle against the Japanese. The Asiatic fleet was also responsible for the defense of Guam while the defense of Wake Island was under the jurisdiction of Admiral Husband Kimmel's Pacific Fleet. In the Philippines, MacArthur counted some 150,000 men, including one fully American regiment, three well-trained regiments of Philippine scouts, two tank battalions, ten inexperienced Philippine divisions, and considerable coastal and anti-aerial artillery. MacArthur also had at his disposal the Far East Air Force, under the command of Major General Lewis Brereton, totaling some 218 modern aircraft, as well as the Philippine Air Corps' six squadrons of obsolete aircraft, a very sizable air force to stem the Japanese offensive. In Guam, although the US didn't think that the island could be successfully defended, naval forces were under the command of Captain George McKillen, counting with some 271 Navy personnel as well as 153 Marines, led by Lieutenant Colonel William McNulty and some 246 volunteers of the Guam Insular Force Guard. Meanwhile, in Hawaii, Admiral Kimmel had noticed the valuable strategic importance of Wake Island since the start of the year, 
ordering the construction of naval base facilities with the objective of turning it into a stronghold, something that wouldn't be completed by the end of 1941. Kimmel had the first defense battalion of marine units for the defense of the American islands in the Pacific, with the other three battalions assigned to Midway and Hawaii. Two detachments were sent to the Johnston and Palmyra Islands, while the rest of the battalion remained at Pearl Harbor. On August 8th, a new detachment of the 1st Defense Battalion was sent to Wake, totaling some 422 Marines under the command of Major James Devereux. In late November, the defense of Wake was placed under the command of Winfield Cunningham, while the defenders would be reinforced with the VMF 211 Squadron of Major Paul Putnam consisting of 12 F4F3 Wildcat fighters. As for the Japanese, limited by the war in China and the attacks against the British and Dutch colonies, they could only count on two divisions and a brigade for their offensives against the American possessions in the Pacific. The rest of the hard work would have to be carried out by the IJN and their special naval landing force, the Japanese equivalent to the US Marines. For the invasion of the Philippines in particular, Tokyo had planned to first neutralize the American air forces in the Philippines to have full control of the air. To do this, they would also need to execute several amphibious invasions against the main American northern airfields to extend Japanese aircraft capabilities. Once air superiority was assured, they would launch their main amphibious assault against Luzon and Mindanao, then advancing across the Philippines to occupy their vital strategic locations. The 14th Army of Lieutenant General Homa Masaharu, consisting of the 16th and 48th Divisions, as well as the 65th Independent Mixed Brigade and two tank regiments, was appointed to carry out this operation, and they would be supported by the 5th Army Air Force Division of Lieutenant General Obata Hideyoshi, consisting of 183 short-range aircraft. The Japanese also appointed Vice Admiral Takahashi Ibo's 3rd Fleet to support the invasion of the Philippines, primarily showcasing a variety of cruisers and destroyers, and providing some 358 valuable long-range aircraft in the form of the 11th Air Fleet. Takahashi's role in the Philippines was to destroy the Asiatic fleet, cover and support the naval landings, and then protect Japanese supply lines and reinforcements. Meanwhile, the 4th Fleet of Vice Admiral Inoue Shigeyoshi was selected to conduct operations against the islands of the Pacific Ocean, including the invasions of Wake and Guam. For the attack on Wake Island, Inoue planned to conduct three days of aerial bombardment, followed by naval landings on Wilkes Island and Wake proper. The invasion force, designated as Comdesron 6 and commanded by Rear Admiral Kajioka Sadamichi, consisted of a covering and support force of cruisers and destroyers, 34 bombers of the 24th Air Flotilla, an occupation force, and 450 SNLF Marines. For the assault on Guam, Inoue assigned the South Seas Detachment of Major General Hori Tomitaro, mainly consisting of 4,886 men from the 144th Infantry Regiment. To support the naval landings on Guam, the Japanese would also appoint the 6th Cruiser Division of Rear Admiral Goto Aritomo, consisting of four heavy cruisers, four destroyers, and 370 SNLF Marines. Inoue also planned to occupy the Gilbert Islands and to conduct bombardments of the Howland and Baker Islands. For this operation, he created a supporting group under the command of Captain Miyazaki Shigatoshi, consisting of two mine layers, two destroyers, and a gunboat, to escort the 51st Naval Garrison Unit in its invasion of the Gilberts. At the same time, the 24th Air Flotilla was placed in charge of the bombardment of the Howland, Baker and Gilbert Islands. As we've seen, on December 2nd, the order to climb Mount Nitaka was given, setting up the final preparations for the Japanese offensives to be launched on December 8th. Three days later, Honma's men departed Hajima en route to Guam with the objective of landing at Tumon Bay on the southwest coast near Merizo and on the eastern shore of Telefofo Bay. The other invasions, however, would have to wait first for the airstrikes to be successful. Meanwhile, at Wake, the American defenders were informed of the attack on Pearl Harbor around 0600, quickly rushing to man the island's defenses. 
four Wildcats were also sent to patrol around Wake, with the rest being prepared for liftoff. Around 0700, Japanese aircraft took off from Formosa, heading towards the Philippines and then striking to Guagaro and Baguio at 0930. At this point, Army bombers returned to Taiwan, leaving the Americans feeling like the attack was over, even though it had just begun. 34 bombers had also taken off at dawn from Roy Island towards Wake, while from Saipan, Japanese aircraft struck Guam, destroying one of their mine layers. At the same time, Japanese bombers from the Marshall Islands shelled Nauru, Howland, Baker and the Gilbert Islands. As a result, airstrips and infrastructure on the islands were damaged, and Howland lost two of its four colonizers. Meanwhile, troop transports from the Marshalls also began to embark en route to the Gilberts. They would arrive on December 9th, with SNLF Marines landing on Mackin and Tarawa unopposed, and starting the construction of seaplane bases there. Two days later, the Japanese would also take control of Little Mackin and Bukati, completing their invasion of the Gilbert Islands. And back to the main action, Japanese Navy bombers caught the Americans unaware at 12.30, bombarding the Iba airfield and destroying a flight of P-40s and its radar station. They then headed to Clark Field, where they managed to destroy most of the American aircraft on the ground, leaving only 17 B-17s operational. By afternoon, half of the Far East Air Force was shattered, assuring Japanese air superiority for the rest of the campaign. At the same time, Japanese bombers at Wake managed to slip through the American patrols, then bombarded the airfield and destroyed eight Wildcats on the ground. They also struck the American camps, defenses and seaplane facilities, causing considerable damage before returning back to the Marshall Islands. In a single day, the Japanese air forces had repeated their success at Pearl Harbor, leaving the American presence in the Pacific severely weakened. Furthermore, some 490 SNLF Marines had already landed on Batan Island, taking control of its small airfield to further execute air operations. This convinced Admiral Hart to order the bulk of the Asiatic fleet to withdraw and join the British and the Dutch on Borneo, just as he had planned. More aerial bombardments over the remaining American airfields would follow in the next few days, destroying most of the remaining aircraft and leaving only a handful of P-40 and B-17s unscathed. Thus MacArthur was left without naval or air forces, alone to defend the Philippines with his ground divisions. Wake and Guam were also hit again on December 9th, although this time the American defenders were prepared to brace against the Japanese attack, so they didn't suffer much damage. More air attacks would follow on December 10th, but this day would also see the first major fighting in the Pacific. Around 0200, Goto's 370 SNLF Marines landed at Aganya Bay, quickly engaging the men of the Guam Insular Force Guard and overtaking their positions with their superior firepower. They subsequently advanced towards Sume and the Marine Barracks, while Hori's South Seas Detachment landed at its objectives practically unopposed, and then started its advance across the island. Some fighting ensued on Aganya's Plaza de España, and soon Captain McKillen saw that further resistance was pointless, calling a ceasefire. Around 0600, he would finally surrender his forces, making Guam the first American territory to fall into Japanese hands. In the meantime, we're going to return to Wake Island, where hell was going to be let loose on December 11th. Early in the morning, Kajioka's invasion force arrived in the vicinity of Wake and proceeded to take positions for the landing of his troops. He subsequently ordered to start the bombardment of the American positions on the beaches. In response, Devereux quickly ordered his forces to track their objectives and to hold their fire for the Japanese ships to get in range of their batteries. Around 0600, as Kajioka's flagship, the Yubari, reached Peacock Point, Devereux knew that it was now or never, so he gave the command to open fire. Immediately, a rain of fire fell upon the Japanese warships. From Peacock Point, Battery A opened fire over the Yubari, hitting her four times on her port side. As Kajoka's flagship turned to starboard while engulfed in smoke, a destroyer swept in and tried to protect her, getting hit once without much damage before Kajoka's escape. At the same time, 
Battery L on Wilkes Island opened fire over the destroyer Hayete, hitting it three times. The destroyer then exploded, broke in two, and finally sank, the first Japanese vessel to sink in the Pacific War. Battery L then targeted another destroyer, hitting it once, but at this point most of the Japanese vessels had already gotten out of range of the American guns. Meanwhile, Battery B on Peel Island exchanged fire with three destroyers and two cruisers, giving and receiving considerable damage without major losses on either side. With the retreat of the invasion force back to the Marshall Islands, the Japanese had been defeated, although this was not the end. Major Putnam's four remaining Wildcats soon pounced on the retiring ships with guns blazing. They managed to explode another destroyer and severely damage one cruiser before the Japanese were out of range, with only one of the Wildcats receiving some damage. Yet despite the great American victory, the Japanese immediately retaliated with an air bombing run over the batteries on Peel Island, which had been pinpointed by Kajioka's forces. Devereux would then change the location of these batteries to the east end of Peel to avoid more losses. Nonetheless, this was the first time the Japanese behemoth had been stopped, and amidst the many failures the Allies had already suffered in the east, it brought hope back to the defenders in the Pacific. But this was hardly the end, as the Japanese would come back once again to take the island in the following weeks. In fact, by December 14th, Japanese bombardments on Wake left only one Wildcat operational. Major Putnam would then start working straight away to repair as many of his planes as possible, with the first repaired Wildcat successfully made operational later that evening. Meanwhile, in Johnston and Palmyra, after the first attack by a submarine returning from Pearl Harbor that luckily didn't do so much damage, a new attack was launched by Japanese submarines that caused serious damage to a powerhouse. In the meantime, by December 17th, despite some fierce aerial bombardment in the last two days, the defenders at Wake Island successfully managed to recuperate another of its Wildcats. And on the last day of the week, the American defenders on Wake would learn of great news, as a PBY landed in the lagoon and told them that a relief expedition was already on its way. Back on December 10th, Admiral Kimmel had created Task Force 14 under the command of Rear Admiral Frank Fletcher, consisting of three heavy cruisers, eight destroyers, the carrier Saratoga, the VMF-211 Squadron, and 210 Marines from the 4th Defense Battalion. They would depart Pearl Harbor on December 15th, heading as fast as they could to reinforce the defenders at Wake. Kimmel had also created Task Force 11 under Rear Admiral Wilson Brown, consisting of the carrier Lexington, three heavy cruisers, and nine destroyers, with the task of striking Japanese bases thought to exist at Jeluit, and with the objective of diverting Japanese forces away from Task Force 14. With help finally on its way, morale on Wake Island was very high. But unbeknownst to them, due to his failure to defend Pearl Harbor, Admiral Kimmel was relieved of his command of the Pacific Fleet on December 17th, being temporarily replaced by Vice Admiral William Pye. Pye had his reservations about the relief expedition, but he still allowed it to continue for the moment, although on December 21st, he would finally decide to recall both task forces back to Pearl Harbor. Back on December 11th, the task force of Admiral Kajioka had suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the US Marines that defended Wake Island. Kajioka had underestimated Wake's defensive capabilities, and as a result, he was forced to limp back to base with two vessels lost and several damaged. But despite his complete failure, Kajioka wasn't relieved from his command. Instead, Admiral Inoue offered him more assistance for a second attack. Operations against Pearl Harbor, Guam, and the Gilbert Islands had concluded successfully in the first week so their forces were now available for Kajioka to command. Inoue thus assigned him the 6th Cruiser Division of Admiral Goto for support, two destroyers from the Gilberts to replace those lost in the first attack, and two aircraft carriers, two cruisers, and two destroyers that were returning from Pearl Harbor to give valuable ground support with their aircraft. 
Now Kajioka had better odds to prove his worth in his second attempt to take Wake Island, departing Roy with his reinforced task force on December 21st. Additionally, the arrival of the carriers Soryu and Hiryu in the vicinity of the island meant that the defenders were going to be subjected to a heavy air bombardment. The attacks managed to destroy all the remaining wildcats and also caused considerable damage to Peel Island. At the same time this was occurring, British and American military leaders, as well as President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, met at Washington in the Arcadia Conference. The conference would last until January 14th, and it would have important effects, which we will discuss down the line. But the most important one would be the reaffirmation of the Europe First strategy, already proposed in past conferences. This meant that the Allies would prioritize offensives in Europe, while in the Pacific, they would adopt a defensive stance. By December 23rd, meanwhile, Kajioka's reinforced task force had finally arrived at Wake Island early in the morning. Under the cover of night, Kajioka planned to land his ground forces and SNLF Marines with naval and air support, hoping that the US Marines would not detect their approach and staging a diversionary bombardment over Peel Island to distract them. Around 0300, the Japanese started to land at Wake Island, with some 580 Marines landing at four different locations and a further 100 Marines landing on the southern shore of Wilkes Island. Heavy fighting ensued, especially around a three-inch gun manned by Lieutenant Robert Hanna which started to fire on the patrol boats used to transport the Japanese marines. Hanna's gun was defended by Major Putnam and the crew of the VMF-211 squadron, which successfully held the perimeter against the Japanese attacks. Although Hanna would manage to explode both of the Japanese patrol boats, the Japanese still landed all their forces and got to cut American communications. This left Major Devereux and Commander Cunningham in the dark, so Devereux would order forces from Peel to mount a last line of defense in front of his command post. A small force of SNLF Marines, the Keshitai, had actually infiltrated undetected on the eastern end of the airfield, advancing up to this last line of defense. And at Wilkes, Captain Platt and his forces had surrounded the 100 SNLF Marines, then executing a surprise attack that inflicted heavy casualties and left the Japanese completely weakened. But despite the Marines' best efforts, Cunningham would decide to surrender at 0700, trying to save as many lives as possible. The American defenders would actually manage to hold most of their positions on wake for 12 hours in total before the news of the surrender reached them. But at that point, Devereux and Cunningham believed most of these positions lost and could not check on them because they had lost communications at the start of the assault. The fall of Wake would nonetheless drop morale for the Allied defenders, but their sacrifice would not be forgotten. Since the start of the war, Tokyo had acknowledged that the British presence in the island of New Britain was a huge threat to one of their most important naval bases in the Pacific, the Truk Atoll. In response, they planned Operation R, an invasion of Rabaul in New Britain and Kavyang in New Ireland. The South Seas detachment of General Hori was earmarked to carry out Operation R after the occupation of Guam, supported by the main strength of Admiral Inoue's 4th Fleet. Due to the rapid progress across all theatres of the Pacific, back on January 4th, the Japanese had started to bombard Rabaul, the old capital of the Australian-controlled territory of New Guinea, in preparation for a naval invasion. Ten days later, the South Seas Detachment departed Truk, escorted by the 4th Fleet's main units. In Rabaul, the Australians had a garrison of around 1,400 soldiers, mainly from the 23rd Brigade, under the command of Colonel John Scanlon, while an independent company of 130 soldiers was also sent to Kevyeng for the protection of the island of New Ireland. On January 20th, the 4th Fleet, including carriers Akagi and Kaga, sent over 100 aircraft, which attacked Rabaul in multiple waves. 
Though the Japanese planes had been detected by Australian coast watchers at the Tabar and Duke of York Islands, Scanlan only had two Wirraways patrolling at 15,000 feet and six more taking off when the enemy aircraft started their attack. Against insurmountable odds, the Australian fighters were rapidly forced out of action, with three getting shot down, three crash landing and one suffering heavy damage. Then the Japanese bombers delivered leisurely high-level bombing attacks against shipping, wharves, airfields and other objectives, successfully sinking the Hulk Westralia, setting aflame the Norwegian merchantman Herstein and completely destroying Rabaul's oil tanks, aerial defences and several aircraft. Only one Hudson and two Wirraways remained undamaged after the fierce Japanese strike. At this point, Scanlan had most of the 2nd 22nd Battalion covering the harbour area, with improvised companies at Prade Point, Talili Bay and on the Lakanai and Vunukanao airfields. Due to the heavy losses sustained, the remaining aircraft were concentrated at Vunukanao and demolitions were started on Lakunai. The following day, a Catalina flying boat discovered that four enemy cruisers were 65 miles southwest of Kavieng en route to Rabaul and managed to send a warning to headquarters before being shot down. Consequently, Scanlan moved all troops from the exposed Malaguna camp, as he did not intend to allow the troops to be massacred by naval gunfire, and further sent an improvised company towards Raluena. Scanlan added that the troops were to be told that it was an exercise only, a decision which resulted in some men going to battle stations lacking hard rations, quinine and other essentials. Finally, the remaining Australian planes were evacuated towards Ley, and demolitions were started on Vunukanao. That day, Kavieng was also attacked by about 60 Japanese aircraft, which concentrated their dive bombing on the town, the gun positions on the airfield, and along the ridge running laterally to the western beaches, where the 2nd 1st Independent Company had established concealed machine gun positions. The Japanese planes were met by brisk fire, and one crashed into the sea beyond Nusa Island, but they also managed to disable the Induna Star, the only transport of the commandos. After the attack, the commandos began to repair the Induna Star at Kaut Harbour, and demolitions were started on Kavieng since it was believed that the town could not be defended. The following morning, the Japanese launched another heavy airstrike on Rabaul, with 45 fighters and bombers successfully bombing Vunikanao and disabling the coast defence guns at Prade Point. With the destruction of his airfields and coastal defences, Scanlan decided that there was no point in defending Rabaul, so he immediately ordered the evacuation and demolition of the town. Thus, civilians headed towards the southern end of the island, completing the evacuation in haste and quiet panic by midday. At the same time, around 400 SNLF marines landed on New Island during the morning, quickly taking the main town of Kavieng and engaging the small force of Australian commandos, which successfully managed to blow up the airfield. After a fierce struggle, the defenders would then have to withdraw towards the Souk River, where they would start guerrilla warfare operations. Meanwhile, as Scanlan believed that the enemy's probable landing places would be within the harbour and therefore wanted to prevent the possibility of part of his force being cut off should the Japanese establish themselves astride the connecting isthmus, he decided to move his troops from the Matupi area and concentrate the companies south of Blanche Bay. But, expecting much resistance, General Horii's plan was different, as there would be three sets of landings. While a battalion landed at Caravia Bay to occupy the Vunakano airstrip, the main force of the 144th Regiment would land between Tawui Point and Prade Point and invade along the main road to Rabaul from the coast. Then a secondary force, under Horii himself, had to land around Matupi Harbour and attack Lakunai Airfield from the sea. The aim of Horii's three-pronged attack was to exploit the lack of Australian numbers by attacking from all quarters so that the airfields could be quickly overrun before defences could be organised. During the cloudy morning of January 22nd, the Japanese invasion fleet anchored off the ocean coast, nowhere near where Scanlan's defenders were waiting. As night fell, Horii ordered his troops to prepare for the landings. Then, at 2148, Two flares erupted from the black outline of the mountains of Rabaul and the order was given to board the landing craft. Two hours later, the barges took off en masse under a moonless yet clear night, gliding across the surface of the water under the light of the flares. The mainland was pitch black, but light from the erupting Matubi volcano and some buildings burning in Rabaul helped guide the craft to shore. 
Though the Nordup beach turned out to be an earth cliff two or three meters high, the bulk of the 144th Regiment managed to land unopposed during the early hours of January 23rd, rapidly moving to occupy Rabaul and Tawui Point. To the south, Horii's secondary force also landed at Matupi Harbour, subsequently seizing Prade Point and Lakunai without resistance, and also capturing the administrator's house after overwhelming a small group of Australian soldiers left inside. The Kawada Battalion, meanwhile, began the landings at Karavia Bay shortly after midnight. Its 8th Company was to land at Reluana to cover the left flank, while its 9th Company had to land south of Vulcan Crater to cover the right flank. Yet there were low hills stretching beyond the shore, and no landmarks could be identified at night, which made it extremely difficult to confirm the designated landing points. For this reason, the 9th Company ended up straying to the north of Vulcan where they met heavy Australian resistance. After suffering many losses, the company then moved southwards, avoiding the front of the Australian positions while getting harassed by the enemy's machine guns and mortars. The 8th Company, meanwhile, successfully landed at 0245, rapidly overrunning the weak Australian positions there. And on Caravia Bay, the bulk of the Kawada Battalion had to cut a path through the jungle to reach the Vunakanao airfield. Progress was slow, unlike the other two incident-free landings, but troops could be freed from elsewhere and were ferried across Simpson Harbour to assist. Thus, as the Japanese began to move on the rearward slopes of Vulcan, in an effort to encircle Major William Owen's A Company, the Australian defenders had no other choice but to withdraw towards four ways at 0700. At the same time, Scanlan withdrew his headquarters to Tomavata, deploying D Company and the remnants of Y Company at Talili Gap to cover the Kokopo Ridge Road and sending B Company to cover Owen's withdrawal. By 0900, however, the Australian position at Three Ways was rapidly becoming untenable as Horii's forces were closing in, so the defenders at the front would soon have to withdraw behind the Nakanao. With his front in disarray, Scanlan decided that it was useless to prolong the action and ordered his forces to withdraw towards the Keravat River, the Warangoi River, or the Malabunga Road, whichever suited his dispersed companies best. He added that it would now be every man for himself, which was understood by his men as a withdrawal in small parties. Meanwhile, the Kawada Battalion continued its trek through the jungle, successfully fighting off three Australian attacks from the south and east, and opening fire on the Talili Gap position shortly after midday. Finally, at 1315, the Japanese broke through to Vunakano, successfully seizing the airfield, while the Australians retreated in disorder. Two hours later, D Company also began its withdrawal, heading through the Kunai to Glade Road. At this point, organised resistance against the Japanese invasion had now ended. Australian soldiers and civilians split into small groups and withdrew through the jungle northwest to the north coast and southeast to the south coast. They had no pre-planned escape routes, assembly points, or emergency supply dumps. Only 120 airmen were picked up at a pre-arranged point down the eastern coast of New Britain. For the rest, they rushed through the bushes in pandemonium in trucks and cars until eventually these broke down. They were running, but often with very little idea of where they were running to. They became exhausted, got lost, were struck down with tropical disease, or simply gave up. The Japanese, meanwhile, carried out extensive mopping-up operations all the way to Atiliklikan Bay and Wide Bay, including one particularly gruesome massacre at the Toll Plantation. Thus, within two weeks, more than half the fleeing Australians had surrendered or been captured. At New Island, meanwhile, the commandos managed to repair the Induna Star by January 30th and attempted to escape the island but the transport was ultimately intercepted by enemy planes while en route to Port Moresby, with the commandos soon becoming prisoners of war. Mopping up operations on New Island had finished on January 24th, with the Japanese then sweeping through Namatanai and its neighbouring islands for four days straight. Yet some of the Australian commandos stationed at Namatanai would not be discovered and would be successfully evacuated between April and May. In the end, 34 Australians were killed during the fighting at Rabaul, around 160 were massacred at Toll in early February, and over 1,000 would be captured by the invaders. Against this, the Japanese lost only 16 killed and 49 wounded. 
Only 400 Australians of the 1,400 personnel at Rabaul successfully escaped to Australia, including Major Owen, who later was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and became the commander of the 39th Battalion during the Cockada Track campaign. Out of the prisoners of war captured in New Britain and New Ireland, 1,053 would be put on the Japanese passenger ship Montevideo Maru for transportation. Travelling unescorted, the Montevideo Maru sailed from Rabaul on June 22nd, but on July 1st, the American submarine Sturgeon torpedoed and sank the Hell ship off the coast of Luzon, in the process killing 1,050 of the 1,053 Australian prisoners. Those prisoners that had remained at Rabaul were later transported aboard the Natano Maru to a prisoner of war camp in Japan, where they remained in captivity until they were released in September of 1945. Following the victory at Rabaul, IJA engineers began repairing and upgrading the damaged airfields. The more remote Vakanao was uneven and on soft ground, but Lakanai, next to the town, offered better potential. By January 25th, it was suitable for fighters, and by mid-February, was able to be used by medium bombers. Luckily for the Japanese, the military facilities and airfields at Rabaul were quickly repaired, with Rabaul soon becoming the biggest Japanese base in the New Guinea area and in the whole South Pacific region. But the Japanese were not the only ones to take action in the Pacific during this period. The Americans, after their infamous defeat at Pearl Harbor, were now ready to respond and take the fight all the way to the main Japanese possessions in the Pacific Ocean, led by the mighty and often invincible aircraft carrier Enterprise. So we ask the question, how did the US respond to Pearl Harbor? Fate played a pivotal role for the USS Enterprise as she narrowly missed being caught at Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7th, 1941. She was, however, immediately brought to the front lines as she had sent out 18 Dauntless at dawn to scout the area and land at Ford Island. These aircraft were caught between the attacking Japanese aircraft and anti-aircraft fire from the ships and shore installations at Pearl Harbor. Seven Dauntless were shot down by the Japanese and friendly fire. When Enterprise received radio messages of the attack, she made the decision to launch an airstrike at 1700 hours, consisting of six Wildcat fighters, 18 Devastator torpedo bombers, and six Dauntless bombers. Unfortunately, they failed to find any targets and were diverted to Hickam Field on Oahu. On top of not finding any targets, upon entering the night sky of Oahu, the Wildcats triggered panic fire and three of them were shot down, killing their pilots, while a fourth aircraft ran out of fuel and was ditched. A rough start for the Americans. One of the first carrier operations would be the relief of Wake Island, which the Japanese began to attack on December 8th. Admiral Fletcher's Task Force 14, centered around Saratoga, was sent to relieve Wake Island, while Admiral Wilson Brown's Task Force 11, centered around Lexington, would undertake a raid on the island of Jaluit in the Marshall Islands as a diversion. However, while en route to Wake Island, at 9 p.m. on December 22nd, the U.S. received information indicating the presence of two IJN carriers and two battleships near Wake Island, forcing Vice Admiral William S. Pye to cancel the relief and redirect Task Forces 14 and 11 back to Pearl Harbor, another tough break for the Americans. In the Atlantic, Yorktown and Hornet departed from Norfolk for the Pacific via the Panama Canal. Yorktown departed on December 16th, reaching San Diego on December 30th, and became the flagship for Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher's newly formed Task Force 17. Hornet was on a training mission just out of Norfolk, and to the surprise of her crew, was experimenting by launching B-25 Mitchell medium bombers from her deck. Her crew did not know the meaning of the experiment, and she would depart from Norfolk later on March 4th en route for the Pacific. Task Force 14 replaced Admiral Fletcher for Rear Admiral Herbert F. Leary and were sent to patrol the vicinity of Midway on December 31, 1941. Admiral Fletcher took Task Force 17 and escorted convoys carrying Marines to reinforce American Samoa, departing on January 6. Task Force 11, commanded by Vice Admiral Wilson Brown, set off to patrol in the direction of Johnson Atoll. 
Task Force 8, commanded by Vice Admiral William Halsey Jr., was sent to protect convoys reinforcing American Samoa on January 11th. After patrolling and assisting convoys out of Samoan waters, Task Force 8 and 17 were dispatched to raid the Marshall and Gilbert Islands. Task Force 17 would strike Jaluit, Mili and Mackin, while Task Force 8 would strike Kwajalein, Wotjer and Taroa. Task Force 17 was screened by only two cruisers, approaching their objectives in the pre-dawn darkness on February 1st. At 4.15am, Yorktown launched 11 Devastators and 17 Dauntless to strike Jaluit, while 14 Dauntless set off for Milliant Mekin. En route to Jaluit, they faced a fierce tropical thunderstorm, with many rain squalls making for poor visibility. The aircraft managed to attack a few Japanese shore installations and shipping, but six aircraft failed to return from the raid as a result of extreme weather. Simultaneously, five Yorktown aircraft attacked Mackin Atoll, also under poor weather. They managed to destroy two large Kawanishi Mavis H6K flying boats and severely damaged gunboat Nagata Maru. The last aircraft attacked Mili Atoll, but the pilots found no real military targets. While searching for ditched aircraft returning from the Jaluit raid, Yorktown's destroyer escorts, which had broken off from the task force, were attacked by a Mavis flying boat and asked for her help. Yorktown launched six F-4F Wildcat fighters to intercept. Pilots E. Scott McCuskey and John P. Adams both closed in on the enemy aircraft, firing simultaneously, destroying it. Yorktown ended up losing four Devastators, three Dauntless and one Seagull floatplane from Louisville. Task Force 8 had the more difficult mission as it needed to neutralize a number of airfields to give itself the best chance of escaping without suffering enemy airstrikes. The issue Enterprise had was she lacked enough bombers to cover all of the targets, and thus she was forced to allocate two divisions of Wildcats with bombing missions. This meant that none of the Dauntless or Devastators would have escorts. On top of this, she would still not have enough bombers, and thus cruisers Salt Lake City and Northampton would bombard Watje, while Chester would bombard Taroa. At 5am, Enterprise launched its first wave to hit Kwajalein consisting of 37 Dauntless and 9 Devastators, while 6 Wildcats went to Watja and Tarao. As the force came over Kwajalein, the enemy began to launch A5M clawed fighters. The Dauntless bombed the grounded aircraft, hangars and small buildings, as Claudes intercepted them. 4 Dauntless were shot down, 2 by Claudes and 2 by anti-aircraft flak. Meanwhile, the 9 Devastators began to torpedo the ships moored in the anchorage. They destroyed mine layer Tokiwa, transports Bordeaux Maru, Yasukuni Maru, and hit the cruiser Katori as she tried to escape, doing serious damage. Simultaneously, the five Wildcats reached Wodger and Tara, where they discovered several parked G3M Nell bombers and Claudes launching to intercept them. One Claude was shot down as the Wildcats strafed and bombed the airfield. The Wildcats sent word to the Enterprise to send more bombers. Thus, nine Devastators and two Dauntless squadrons followed up later, bombing the airfields. Despite the air attacks, it was not enough to neutralize the threat, and so Northampton and Salt Lake City began to bombard Watcher, while Chester and a pair of destroyers bombarded Taroa. Several Claudes tried desperately to attack the enemy, and one managed to drop a small bomb on Chester, forcing the task force to withdraw. Then, eight G3M Nels located Enterprise fleeing 100 miles away and raced to bomb her as she launched her six Wildcats to intercept. The Nels released their bombs, some as close as 30 yards away from the Enterprise, all missing. Enterprise's anti-aircraft fire and her Wildcats took down one Nell before they withdrew. Fifteen Japanese aircraft had been destroyed, with three IJN warships damaged and light to moderate damage was done to the three islands' naval garrisons. Task Force 8 lost five Dauntless, one Wildcat and one floatplane from Salt Lake City. Following the Marshall and Gilbert raids, Task Force 8 was sent back to Pearl Harbor, where Enterprise was reassigned to Task Force 16. Task Force 16 was directed to depart on Valentine's Day of 1942 to raid Wake Island, 
which had been occupied by Japan since December 22nd. Task Force 16 arrived at the launch point on February 24th, preparing to launch aircraft before dawn. Enterprise launched six Wildcats, 36 Dauntless, and nine Devastators, set to reach Wake in 30 minutes. Meanwhile, Northampton, Salt Lake City, Maury, and Balch had detached from the task force to bombard Wake. Japanese air searches detected the ships before they arrived, and eight Nakajima E-8N Daves, carrying small bombs, attacked them, hitting no targets. The four US ships then began to bombard Peel Island as the US aircraft arrived. The Dauntless of VB-6 bombed a seaplane base, sinking two H-6K flying boats, hit a radio station and oil tanks. VS-6 and VT-6 together bombed Wake's airfield, hitting grounded aircraft and strafing gun positions. One Dauntless was hit by anti-aircraft fire and forced to ditch off the island's coast. Both pilots were taken prisoner. The two cruisers also launched their Curtis SOC Seagull seaplanes, which dropped small 100-pound bombs on buildings on the northwest part of Wake. On their way out, the bombarding party shot at two patrol boats, with Belch managing to sink one. The following day, Task Force 16 were ordered to raid Marcus Island, situated 600 miles northwest of Wake. Task Force 16 proceeded to a point 175 miles northeast of Marcus, and Enterprise launched a strike group of 32 Dauntless with six Wildcats as escort. The strike force made it over the island while it was still dark, so several Dauntless dropped parachute flares illuminating the island. The Dauntless of VB-6 quickly bombed the runways, air facilities and oil tanks. VS-6 followed this up by hitting a radio building under heavy anti-aircraft fire. It turned out there were no enemy aircraft, as the airfields were just under construction. One Dauntless was lit on fire from anti-aircraft fire and forced to ditch 10 miles off the coast. Both pilots were taken prisoner. The Japanese capture of Rabaul in early February threatened the crucial San Francisco-Australian sea lane supply line. Admiral Chester Nimitz devised a plan to solve the threat by sending Task Force 11 to raid Rabaul on February 21st. The raid called for an airstrike followed by a surface bombardment. As Task Force 11 approached Rabaul due east on the morning of February the 20th, they encountered an enemy patrol flying boat. At 10.15 a.m., Lexington's radar picked up incoming aircraft, so Lexington launched a six-plane patrol with two Wildcat fighters to intercept them. The patrol shot down four Kawanishi H-6 K-4 Mavis, but not before they had sent word back to Rabaul, prompting Vice Admiral Sigayoshi Inoue to order an airstrike from Rabaul accompanied by four cruisers against Task Force 11. Seventeen Bettys of the 4th Kokutai took off from the Vunukanoa airfield en route to attack. Task Force 11 knew they had lost the chance to raid Rabaul and began to flee the area, when at 3.42pm, their radar picked up incoming aircraft. Lexington launched six Wildcats to intercept, followed by four more, and held six in the air to defend her. Five out of the first nine Bettys to arrive were shot down, as the remaining four tried to bomb Lexington under heavy fire. Their bombs landed 3,000 yards short of the carrier, as three more Bettys were shot down at the cost of two Wildcats who received returning fire. The last Betty tried to escape, but a Dauntless pilot shot her down. The second formation of Bettys was detected by radar at 4.49pm. With the majority of the Wildcats chasing the previous formation, only two Wildcats were available to confront this formation. The two Wildcats made a series of high-scale diving attacks on the Betty's V formation, managing to shoot down three Betty's and send one limping away. The remaining four Betty's dropped their bombs, missing Lexington by only 100 yards each. As the Betty's withdrew, only two would make it back home, as they had sustained heavy damage and had to ditch. The Japanese had lost 23 aircraft and 130 men at the cost of two Wildcats and a single pilot for Task Force 11. The American raids had a major psychological effect on the IJN. The IJN now believed the Americans were willing to risk their carriers to thwart further Japanese operations in the Pacific. 
Consequently, the Akagi, Kaga and Suikaku sortied in search of New Guinea US naval forces raiding the Marshall and Gilbert Islands on February 1, 1942. Yet the IJN carriers were unable to track the US task forces, and were quickly recalled for a new mission, by mid-February 1942. The Japanese had captured Ambon, Celebes and Borneo. Landings on Timor were scheduled for February 20th, and an invasion of Java was planned to take place shortly after. In order to protect these landings from Allied interference, the Japanese needed to neutralize Darwin. Darwin, Australia was the key to the South Pacific air ferry routes. During the outbreak of the Pacific War, several Australian Army and RAAF units stationed in Darwin were sent to strengthen defences in the Dutch East Indies, such as at Ambon and Timor. By mid-February 1942, Darwin had become an important Allied base for the defence of the Dutch East Indies. Yet despite its strategic importance, the city was poorly defended. It held 16 QF 3.7-inch AA guns and two 3-inch AA guns to counter high-altitude aircraft. It also had Lewis guns for use against low-flying aircraft. The air forces stationed there comprised the No. 12 Squadron, equipped with CAC Wiraway Advanced Trainers, and the No. 13 Squadron, which had Lockheed Hudson Light Bombers. They were also backed up by nine Lockheed Hudsons arriving from the No. 2 and No. 13 Squadrons on February 19th, after the evacuation of Timor. In addition to the Australian forces, 10 USAAF Curtis P-90 Warhawks were passing through Darwin en route to Java the day she would be attacked. A total of 65 Allied warships and merchant vessels were in Darwin Harbour. The Japanese fleet was commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagamo and led by the Kido Batai. The force comprised 188 aircraft from the Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu and Soyu, which all had participated in the attack on Pearl Harbour. In addition to their aircraft were 34 land-based bombers, 27 Nels from Ambon and 27 Betis from the Celebes. The fleet was supported by two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, seven destroyers and three submarines. This would be the first enemy attack on Australian soil in the history of the Commonwealth of Australia and is often described as Australia's Pearl Harbour. The IJN carriers launched 188 aircraft at 8.45am on February 19th including 81 Kates, 71 Vals, and 36 Zeros. The Akagi contributed 18 Kates, 18 Vals, and 9 Zeros. The first wave was led by Commander Mitsuo Fujida, who had commanded the first wave of the Pearl Harbor attack. There was no functional radar to provide Darwin early warning, but at 9.35 am, an Australian coast watcher, Father McGrath of the Sacred Heart Mission on Bathurst Island, saw the aircraft and sent a pedal radio signal to Darwin. The message was relayed to the RAAF by 9.37 am, but no general alarm was raised until 10 am as the RAAF officers assumed it was just USAAF P-40s returning to Darwin. Petty officer Yoshikazu Nagahama was flying a zero when he was separated from his squadron. He arrived over Darwin early and alone. He engaged five P-40s, single-handedly shooting down four of them. At 9.58 am, the Japanese aircraft began to arrive over Darwin, and the HMAS Gunbar was the first ship to be attacked, strafed by several Zeros. The air raid sirens began as the Japanese bombers commenced dive bombing and level bombing attacks on the ships in the harbour. In 30 minutes, the first wave of Japanese bombers sank three warships, six merchant ships, and damaged ten other vessels. The US destroyer Perry sank in minutes, killing 80 of her crew. The large US transport Mikes sank, killing two people, and the Australian ship Neptuna, loaded with explosives, was hit, causing a terrible explosion, killing 45 of her crew and the ship's captain, William Mitchie. Just before the attack, 70 waterside workers had been unloading the Neptuna and Barossa on the long pier that was hit, blowing many of them into the water and burning oil. 21 of these workers are known to have died from the bombs or in the water. The town's post office was hit, killing nine civilians. All but one of the remaining P-40s were destroyed on the ground at RAAF Darwin. The remaining P-40, flown by First Lieutenant Robert Ostreicher, was airborne throughout the first attack and managed to shoot down one vowel and damage another. The Japanese bombed and strafed the base and civil airfield alongside the town's army barracks and oil store, 
causing severe damage. The first wave lost up to five aircraft and three crew members, while 34 aircraft were damaged. At 10.10 am, the bombers began to make their return to their carriers, when they noticed two Philippine-registered freighters lying outside the port, the Florence D and the Don Isidro. The second wave was made up of 54 land-based bombers, consisting of 27 Mitsubishi G3Ms and 27 G4Ms, which arrived over Darwin as its sirens rang again at 11.58am upon sight of the bombers. The second wave separated into two groups, flying at 18,000 feet. One bombed the RAAF base from the southwest, while the other approached from the northeast. They both arrived over the base simultaneously, dropping their bombs, turning around, and bombing a second time. Due to defective fuses, the Australian heavy anti-aircraft flak guns were unable to score any significant hits on the high-flying aircraft. All the bombers made a clean getaway around 12.20pm. The damage inflicted on the RAAF base was extensive, but casualties were light. Six Lockheed Hudsons, two P-40s and a B-24 were destroyed and six RAAF personnel were killed at the RAAF base. The IJN carriers launched a small number of fouls during the afternoon to attack the Florence D and Don Isidro, which had been noticed by the first wave coming back. The Don Isidro was rapidly sunk north of Melville Island, with 11 of her 84 crew killed. The dive bombers sank Florence D off Bathurst Island, killing four of her crew. The bombing of Darwin caused the available surface shipment support efforts to Java and the Philippines to be effectively sealed off for the Allies. Seven of 11 above-ground oil storage tanks, located on Stokes Hill, were destroyed. Up to an estimated 236 people were killed, with 300 to 400 wounded. 30 aircraft were destroyed, with 11 ships sunk, 3 run aground and 25 damaged. Over 681 bombs, weighing a total of 251,500 pounds, were dropped by 205 bombers, which exceeded the tonnage dropped on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese lost as few as five aircraft, with 34 aircraft damaged. The loss of life at Pearl Harbor was greater, at around 2,400 deaths, compared to the estimated 236 for Darwin. As the attack leader, Commander Mitsuo Fujida said about using such an overwhelming force against such a soft target, It was hardly worthy of us. If ever a sledgehammer was used to crack an egg, it was then. The IJN scored another major victory. But these victories would contribute to what many historians called victory disease, and the outcome will be seen later on in the Battle of Midway. Additionally, on March 4th, the Japanese launched Operation K, an unsuccessful air raid carried out by two Kawanishi H-8K flying boats against Pearl Harbor. They failed to gain intelligence over the state of Hawaii and the Pacific Fleet, and they only caused minor damage on the islands. A follow-up to this raid was launched on March 10th, but one of the flying boats was shot down by a Brewster F-2A Buffalo near the Midway Atoll, provoking the eventual cancellation of the operation. Now we turn to the island of New Guinea, where the Japanese were planning their first offensive operation after the fall of Rabaul. To fully control the seas north of Australia and completely cut off the British Dominion, the invaders were now planning to invade Port Moresby in British New Guinea and Tulagi in the Solomon Islands. But before that, the Japanese first needed to occupy the Salamawa Lei area to establish an airbase for the support of further operations in the region. Back on February 8th, the invaders had expanded from Rabaul with a naval landing at Surimi and Gasmata, capturing the airfield there without opposition. With Gasmata firmly under their control, the Japanese would then prepare for the invasion of Salamoa Lai. The plan was for a battalion of the South Seas Detachment to capture Salamoa and its airfield, while 620 SNLF Marines landed at Lai and rapidly secured the area. They were to be escorted by a fleet mainly consisting of two light cruisers and six destroyers, under the command of Admiral Kajioka. Back on February 20th, the 4th Fleet had also been subjected to an air raid by a US aircraft carrier task force, under Admiral Wilson Brown, that forced Admiral Inoue to delay the launch of the invasion. Although Japanese bombers were launched to intercept the American task force, and they succeeded in their objective of forcing the Americans to turn back, the loss of 23 aircraft was enough reason to postpone the operation. 
To prevent another air raid over the 4th Fleet, Inoue dispatched a support fleet consisting of four heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and two destroyers under the command of Admiral Goto. Finally, on March 5th, the invasion force departed Rabaul, heading to the Salamoa Lae area. Under a violent storm, the Horie unit landed on Salamoa in the early hours of March 8th, while the SNLF marines landed at the coast to the south of Lae. Prior to their landings, the 200 Australian defenders had already retreated to Wau after executing demolition operations to prevent the use of their facilities for the invaders. After only a couple of hours, the Horie unit captured Salamoa, its airfield and the town of Keller, while the SNLF marines did the same for Lai and its airfield. In the meantime, two task forces were assigned to Admiral Brown to carry out a new air raid, this time over the recently established Japanese presence in the Samalawa Lai area. The Americans had achieved great success on their previous raids over the Gilberts, the Marshals, Rabaul, Wake and Minami Torishima, and Admiral Chester Nimitz, new commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, believed that this attack would have the advantage of surprise and could thus be deadly. By March 10th, Brown's forces had advanced undetected to the Gulf of Papua off the southern shore of New Guinea, where he ordered the SBD Dauntless Bombers, TBD Devastator Torpedo Bombers and F4F Wildcats to lift off and prepare for the incoming attack. At about 0840, 104 American planes were in the air, preparing to head for their objectives. This time they found no opposing enemy fighters, so the element of surprise was on their side. The Lexington group arrived at a position above Lae around 0920 and immediately started to bombard shipping there. Three large Japanese transports were at Lae and they were repeatedly strafed by the fighters, while dozens of bombs fell around them, resulting in their complete destruction. The Lexington group then headed to Salamaua, while some bombers approached targets of opportunity, damaging the cruiser Yubari, two destroyers, the mine layer Sigaru, and two more transports. Meanwhile, the Yorktown group, following on the heels of the Lexington group, repeatedly assaulted the Yubari, causing severe damage to Kajioka's flagship. Although the Americans believed the cruiser to have sunk, the Ubari had managed to control the damage after evading 67 bombs and 12 torpedoes. The Yorktown group then strafed Salamaua, inflicted severe damage on a seaplane tender, and got to sink a minesweeper. Following Brown's strike, eight B-17 bombers from Townsville arrived on March 11th and bombed the area as well, causing further damage on the facilities and on the Ubari. This was the first time the Allies had inflicted large-scale damage during a counterattack since the start of the war, and was a portent of the future direction of campaigns in the South Pacific area. The Japanese had lost four vessels and had to send seven more to be repaired, but the issues raised by the successful counterattack were hidden in the shadow of the fall of Java. Despite the success of Brown's raid, though, the Japanese had achieved a foothold over the island of New Guinea and the Allies had much to fear if Australia was cut off. For now, we'll return to the Dutch East Indies, where new operations were taking place. The fall of Java back in early March signified the end of organized resistance in the Indies, but there were still small garrisons or guerrilla groups operating on some of the islands. One of these places was Dutch New Guinea, which up until now hadn't been attacked by the invaders. A small navy unit of up to 1,500 men was formed on March 15th to annihilate Dutch resistance in New Guinea and occupy the strategic points of that island. On March 29th, this unit departed Ambon towards Seram Island, escorted by a small fleet under Rear Admiral Fujita Ruitaro. Two days later, it first landed on Boila without opposition, finding the oil field there completely destroyed. From there, the invaders moved to Fafak, Babo and Sorong, again finding very little resistance. They then headed north, diverting to occupy Ternate and Jailolo on April 7th before continuing eastwards. On April 12th, the Japanese finally got to Manokwari, where they forced the 150 defenders to retreat into the mountains. A small garrison was left on Manokwari, while the bulk of the invasion force continued eastwards. By April 20th, the Japanese had gotten to Yapen Island and Hollandia, encountering almost no opposition at any of the ports that they moved through. Thinking that the Dutch had an insignificant strength on the island, 
Vegeta then decided to return to Ambon with his force, leaving only the small garrisons already established on Dutch New Guinea. After the demise of Abdicom, as we have seen, the Pacific Theater had been left under the responsibility of the United States. While General MacArthur was appointed to command the Southwest Pacific area, the remainder of the Pacific Ocean was entrusted to Admiral Nimitz and his Pacific Fleet, leaving the US Army and Navy divided among the commands of MacArthur and Nimitz. As such, both commands would frequently compete for resources and accuse the other of misusing them, showing a clear lack of cooperation between the Army and Navy. Yet today, we'll see one of the first coordinated operations between Army and Navy elements, something that will be key for the future. At this point, the Japanese were also consolidating their gains in the Pacific. Up until now, they had achieved every last one of their objectives with relative ease, so they were still planning what to do next. Plans for an invasion of Australia were drawn, but the IJA refused to support such an undertaking instead favoring renewed operations against China. An invasion of Ceylon was also discarded, so the Japanese could just focus on the New Guinea campaign for now, hoping to then expand into Fiji, Samoa and New Caledonia to completely cut off Australia from the US. In that regard, Admiral Inoue had sent Rear Admiral Kanazawa Masao with three destroyers and a two-platoon strong naval force to occupy strategic points in the northern Solomon Islands. In early March, these units would first head to Booker Island, where they planned to establish an important airfield, before returning to Rabaul. On March 28th, Kanazawa again departed Rabaul, landing his forces at Shortland Island two days later. From there, the Japanese then occupied Keita on Bougainville, where the 20 Australian commandos of the first independent company that held the island retreated inland to later be evacuated. Soon, the invaders would secure their grip over Bougainville, where they would later build up naval and air bases for future operations in the Solomons. On April 8th, Inoue would also send Japanese forces to occupy, without any resistance, the Admiralty Islands and Talisea, while also starting to conduct air operations against Port Moresby, his next main objective. But amidst Inoue's rapid progress, a catastrophic event would force the Japanese to switch their main efforts from the New Guinea campaign. While new garrison forces were sent to the Allied-controlled islands in the Pacific Ocean to secure a southern lifeline for Australia, Admiral Ernest King, the commander-in-chief of the US fleet, was planning a bold bombing raid against the heart of Japan, Tokyo itself. Unfortunately, long-range bomber bases in the Philippines were gone so the Americans would have to think outside of the box for this one. The only alternative that they could think of would be a carrier-borne attack like those the Japanese had executed on Pearl Harbor, Darwin and Ceylon. But the American aircraft carriers would have to get dangerously close to Japan, and the loss of any of them would be fatal. Here's where Captains Francis Lowe and Donald Duncan come in, developing a plan to launch land-based B-25 bombers from a carrier's deck. The bombers would have to reduce their weight and increase their fuel capacity, but this would effectively allow carriers to launch a raid from a safer distance. The only issue was that they could not return to the carriers, so the Americans decided that the pilots would have to continue towards China. General Stilwell had to negotiate with Chiang Kai-shek for the use of Chinese airfields, and although the Generalissimo was wary of possible Japanese retaliations, he approved the operation in the end. Thus, the plan was for Admiral Halsey's Task Force 16 to join Task Force 18, mainly built around the carrier Hornet, and get within 400 miles of Japan for the takeoff of 16 modified B-25B bombers, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, which would carry out the bombing strike against the Japanese mainland on the night of April 18th. Meanwhile, the protection of the Japanese mainland and the Imperial Palace was in the hands of Admiral Yamamoto of the IJN. The 5th Fleet of Vice Admiral Hosegaya Bushiro, consisting of a mixture of light cruisers, armed merchantmen and gunboats, patrolled the waters east of Japan with a flotilla of patrol boats and picket ships that were deployed offshore to detect any enemy fleet activities. In the air, the Japanese counted with the 26th Air Flotilla of Rear Admiral Yamagata Masato, which was composed of land attack and carrier-based naval aircraft, 
with the 1st Air Army, subordinated to General Prince Higashikuni Naruhiko, mainly consisting of obsolete Nakajima Type 97 Ki-27 interceptors and some prototype Kawasaki Ki-61 Hien fighters. As we can see, the Japanese assigned more importance to their expansionist operations than to the defense of their homeland, not believing their enemies were in any shape to launch an attack against Tokyo so early in the war. But they were wrong. On April 12th, Task Force 18 left San Francisco Bay while conducting the final preparations and training for the strike. Six days later, Halsey's Task Force 16 departed Pearl Harbor to intersect with the course of the carrier Hornet. Both forces finally met on April 13th, then continuing west towards Japan without any incidents. At dawn on April 18th, however, the picket ship Nitomaru sighted the American force and immediately radioed a warning to Hosagaya, who decided to send his ships and the Kido Batai in search of the enemy. Yet the Japanese admiral actually expected to engage the Americans the following day, thinking they would have to get 200 miles closer to Japan. In turn, Halsey sent some Wildcats and the Dauntless to destroy the picket ship, followed by the cruiser Nashville, which managed to sink it with gunfire. Knowing that they had been discovered, Halsey then ordered to launch the attack 10 hours early and 170 nautical miles further than planned. So Doolittle and his pilots prepared for the flight and then took off from the Hornet at 0820. Meanwhile, Halsey would rush back to Pearl Harbor, fighting off enemy patrol ships and safely arriving on April 25th. The launch was successful, but now the Americans would have to attack in daylight and cover a longer distance. During his cruise, Doolittle divided his force into five flights which would hit different key points in Japan. They finally got to their objectives at noon, completely catching the Japanese with their guard down, which had indeed been alerted, but were not expecting an attack so soon. Doolittle and 12 other bombers fell upon Tokyo, dropping their bombs over several military arsenals and industrial facilities, and leaving the area covered in a smoky haze. Some Japanese interceptors lifted off to engage the American bombers, but they were amazed to see their bullets bounce off the bomber's skin. The Americans claimed that they had effectively shot down three of these interceptors, and most notably, no bomber was shot down. Aside from Tokyo, three bombers attacked Yokohama's oil refineries, warehouses and dockyards, with one of them causing severe damage to the submarine tender Taigai, which was being converted into the light aircraft carrier Ryuho. And finally, the last flight of three bombers dropped their load over Nagoya and Kobe, also gathering much useful information over facilities and defenses on these cities for use in future raids. As the bombers made their escape southwards, very large fires could be seen in Tokyo. And by the time the 5th Fleet's aircraft arrived there, the Americans were already long gone. Most of the American bombers then successfully flew to China, where they would manage to escape almost unscathed. Only one of them had to head north to the Soviet Union due to fuel shortages. The bomber, led by Captain Edward York, would then crash on Soviet soil, where the pilots were interned. The rest safely arrived in China, but due to fuel shortages, bad weather, and the early launch of the operation, they had to crash in the interior of China, so all of the 16 bombers were lost, with three pilots losing their lives, and eight pilots getting captured by the Japanese. Yet, despite these losses, the Doolittle raid had been a complete success. Although the damage inflicted to Japan was light, it had shown that the Japanese were not really invincible, thus improving the morale of the Americans and leaving the Japanese shocked about their newfound vulnerability. The IJN and Yamamoto had been humiliated and would have to increase the number of aircraft for the defense of the homeland to 250 planes. As a result, the IJA began the Zhejiang Jiangxi campaign, Operation Seigo, to prevent the eastern coastal provinces of China from being used again for future bombing raids. Due to this humiliation, Yamamoto then decided that the destruction of the American carrier fleet was imperative for the safety of Japan and for the success of future operations in the Pacific. In that regard, he wanted to meet the US Navy in a decisive battle with a planned invasion of Midway. Although originally there had been opposition to the Midway operation, 
the IJN was the only one to blame for the Doolittle raid. So the focus ended up moving from the New Guinea campaign to the Western Pacific offensive. Thus, the Japanese began their path towards their demise and towards the major turning point of the Pacific War. It is late April 1942. The Japanese Empire has proven its military might unstoppable as the invaders expanded all across the Pacific, from Nanking to the island of Java and from Burma to the island of New Britain. Here at the main base of Rabaul, Admiral Inoue prepared to continue his operations in New Guinea. Although he had at the time successfully achieved all his objectives with the capture of many points in the region, the continuous air bombing attacks that the Allies were carrying out from Port Moresby and northeastern Australia proved to be a constant thorn in his side. Thus, the Japanese Admiral had selected the capital of Papua as his next expansionist goal, since long-range Japanese aircraft could also target northeastern Australia from there. Yet American carrier-based raids, such as those carried out against Salamaua and Leh, had inflicted considerable losses on Inoue's force, something that forced the IJN to put on hold any further advances on the region of New Guinea until sufficient naval and air forces could be assembled to defeat the Americans. This was in the hands of Admiral Yamamoto, who at this point was dedicated to his own expansionist goals in the Central Pacific, specifically against the island of Midway. Here he believed he could arrange for a decisive battle against the American carriers. Many naval commanders, including Admiral Nagano Asami, opposed this plan, stating that this could indeed be a decisive battle, but that it was going to be fought in the enemy's backyard. But as we've seen, all opposition against Yamamoto's plans collapsed after the disastrous Doolittle raid, so the midway operation was then approved. For Inoue, who believed in controlling an interlocking network of island air bases to assure the Japanese far-flung perimeter in the Pacific, this was very bad news. But despite this, he was thankfully granted the 5th Carrier Division and the 25th Air Flotilla to support the Port Moresby operation before it was used against Midway. This operation, codenamed MO, was divided into several phases. First, Rear Admiral Shima Kiyohide's Tulagi invasion force was to advance down the Solomon Islands to establish a seaplane base on Tulagi by May 3rd and thus secure the left flank of the operation. Then, the carrier task force of Admiral Takegi was to sail into the Coral Sea to execute a series of surprise air raids over northeastern Australia by May 7th. Inoue believed that there would be no American carriers in the area after their participation in the Doolittle raid, as the IJN assumed all but one of the US carriers were in the Central Pacific, so he judged that the air bases at Townsville and Charters Towers were the main threat to his operation and had to be quickly neutralized. After the surprise air raids, only then were expected Allied naval forces to appear, so the carriers would refuel and move back to the Coral Sea to intercept them. Finally, Admiral Kajioka's invasion force would depart Rabaul and move with haste towards Port Moresby to land the South Seas detachment of General Horii and two reinforced companies of SNLF Marines by May 10th. They would be covered by a small fleet under Rear Admiral Marimo Kuninori that would also set up seaplane bases at Des Boines Island and Cape Rodney to protect the convoy's transit. Furthermore, both invasion forces would be supported by a large fleet that included the light carrier Shoho, commanded by Admiral Goto. But unbeknownst to the Japanese, American codebreakers had successfully deciphered the IJN's row code, so Admiral Nimitz was rapidly alerted of the impending attack on Port Moresby. After discussing his plans with Admiral King, Nimitz then decided to send all four aircraft carriers of the Pacific Fleet towards the Coral Sea to disrupt the Japanese offensive. Two of these carriers, however, had just returned from the Tokyo raid, and even though they departed immediately, they would not arrive at the Coral Sea in time to participate in the operation. This only left the carriers Yorktown and Lexington to assume the offensive, under the overall command of Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. In that regard, Fletcher's Task Force 17 was to depart Tongatabu on April 27th en route to the Coral Sea, 
where it would be reinforced by Task Force 11, led by Rear Admiral Aubrey Fitch. He would also be supported by General MacArthur's Task Force 44 and by the Allied Air Force of the Southwest Pacific Area. Meanwhile, the Japanese were carrying out the final preparations for Operation MO. Inoue also faced some reluctance from his admirals, something that forced Yamamoto to intervene on April 29th to cancel the carrier-borne strikes against Australia. That same day, the invaders finally put in motion the operation, with the departure of the Tulagi invasion force from Rabaul covered by Goto's fleet. By May 2nd, the Japanese convoy had been spotted south of Buka, and the 24 Australian commandos in Tulagi began the destruction and demolition of their facilities on the island before evacuating themselves the following morning. Their escape was close, as on that night, around 400 SNLF marines disembarked unopposed on the islands of Tulagi and Givutu, supported by aircraft from Rabaul and from the carrier Shoho, immediately beginning construction of the planned seaplane base there and denying Fletcher some much-needed reconnaissance over the eastern Coral Sea. In response, the American Admiral, who was already in the central Coral Sea, but had not yet been joined by Fitch, decided to turn north to strike against the Japanese at Tulagi. Concurrently, Goto and the Shoho had departed for Rabaul to cover Kajioka's convoy, so the Japanese had no air support there. At dawn on May 4th, the Yorktown launched its first wave bombers, achieving complete surprise and damaging the destroyer Kikazuki. The same aircraft then turned around for a second strike, and a third wave of 21 dive bombers soon followed. The resulting raid was very disappointing, only sinking three minesweepers and four landing barges. A fourth strike by four Wildcat fighters was more successful, strafing the five Type 97 flying boats on Tulagi until they were destroyed, but it was hardly worth it for the price of revealing that there were American carriers in the area. The American air raid over Tulagi had surprised the Japanese on the island, who believed that they would be covered by Takagi's carrier force. Back on May 1st, this force had also departed Truk, but were now running into trouble as they were unable to complete their first mission. They had to deliver nine zeros to Rabaul, but bad weather had been preventing them from doing so by May 3rd, so they could not provide the necessary air cover for Tulagi. When Takagi heard about the American raid, he quickly rushed to the southeast to retaliate, but Fletcher had already escaped to the south. There, the American Admiral rendezvoused with Task Force 11 on May 5th, and then turned southeast to refuel. The following day, with all his forces merged into Task Force 17, Fletcher created several task groups in preparation for battle. During this time, MacArthur had been reconnoitering the Solomon Sea in search of the enemy, and although Fletcher had been informed of the presence of Japanese carriers, he was unaware of their location. MacArthur sent US B-17 bombers based in Australia to attack the Japanese Port Moresby invading force, including Goto's warships. He radioed Fletcher with reports of the location of the IJN force and the presence of a carrier. At noon, a Japanese flying boat managed to spot the American force, so Fletcher had to assume his position was compromised. He also believed his enemy to be to the northwest, conducting the invasion of Port Moresby so he headed to the Luyadis to strike at the convoy. In reality, Takagi was still refueling to the northeast when the flying boat's reports reached him. The two carriers then turned south to chase the contact, but Admiral Hara was very careful not to reveal his presence. The two forces managed to get close to one another, but Hara's passiveness prevented the Japanese from scoring a deadly blow. At this point, however, a clash was completely unavoidable. Meanwhile, Kajioka's invasion convoy had departed Rabaul on May 4th, getting off Misima Island by the time the battle was going to occur, and Marimo's small fleet had also successfully disembarked on Deboyne Island to construct a seaplane base there. Covering both of them was Goto's main fleet, and Fletcher was headed straight towards him. At dawn on May 7th, as both sides unsuccessfully searched for one another, Fletcher sent a group of cruisers and destroyers under Rear Admiral John Crace to prevent the Japanese convoy from passing south of the Luyadis. The reconnaissance was critical at this point, as whoever got it first would have the upper hand. 
Hara ended up being the first one, but things didn't turn out so marvelously. What his scouts actually spotted was the oiler Nyusho and his escort. Upon reporting this, Takagi allowed Hara to launch all available aircraft from the Shokaku, and upon getting there, the 78 aircraft, led by Lieutenant Commander Takahashi Kakuichi, were surprised not to find a carrier force. Takahashi decided to attack them nonetheless, and in 18 minutes, both ships were left sinking. Yet the planes would not get back to their carriers until the afternoon, something that was very worrisome for Hara. Although he knew that he could not launch another strike that day, luckily his position was still unknown for Fletcher. Furthermore, he was now receiving reports that the Americans were southeast of Russell Island, so at least he knew the location of the enemy. Earlier that day, however, the American Admiral also received information from his scouts. They had sighted Goto's fleet northwest of Russell Island, but Fletcher was informed that these were two aircraft carriers, so he decided to send a total of 93 aircraft against the enemy. Although the American planes had been directed against an incorrect objective, just as the Japanese had, they would find there an area rich in more suitable targets. In the meantime, Inoue had turned the invasion convoy to the north until the engagement was over, and Goto was preparing the Shoho to launch its own strike against the enemy. Unbeknownst to him, these would be the last hours for the light carrier. Lexington's air group, led by Commander William Ault, was the first to arrive, conducting one of the best coordinated carrier-borne attacks of the entire war. They were only faced in the air with a Zero and two Type 96 A5Ms, which only got to shoot down one of the American bombers. While the SBD-3 Dauntless dive bombers were dropping their first bombs, the Shoho conducted a sharp turn to port to evade her attackers. Initially, this was successful, but then the carrier received two hits that caused massive fires in the hangar deck. One minute later, the Shoho was finished off when the TBD-1 Devastator torpedo bombers fell upon her and scored five hits on the light carrier. At this point, Yorktown's air group arrived, and although the Shoho was already doomed and listing, they successfully hit her with around 11 bombs and five torpedoes, thus leaving the carrier torn apart and with a death toll of 631 men. By noon, both air groups were recovered by their carriers, but Fletcher decided against launching another strike due to bad weather and the coming nightfall. Although Fletcher was happy with his results, Crace's small fleet was in great peril at the same time. He had been spotted southeast of the Jomard Passage, and two waves of G3M Type 96 bombers from Rabol quickly fell upon him. Crace's skillful maneuvering and heavy anti-aircraft fire luckily prevented a disaster, suffering only light damage and taking down five of the enemy bombers. For Inoue, Operation MO was now in shambles, and he had to recall the invasion convoy to the north, while also sending two heavy cruisers to reinforce Takagi. The continuation of the invasion now depended on the success of the carrier force, so Hara decided to order an increased search to the west. They would be followed by a risky dusk strike, but the tired crews would find nothing in the area. On their return home, however, they ran afoul of the American carriers, yet they thought they were their own. Intercepted by 11 Wildcats and met with anti-aircraft fire upon trying to land on the carriers, the Japanese remarkably only lost nine aircraft, but their loss would leave them outnumbered the following day. Now both sides knew they were close to one another, with the Americans moving west and the Japanese north during the night to be in a favorable position for the incoming carrier battle. At dawn on May 8th, both sides continued to carry out their final scouting operations. It wouldn't take long for each to find what they were looking for. Yet again, Hara would be the first to get information about the enemy, which was reported south of the Luiades. A few minutes later, Fletcher was informed that the Japanese were east of the Luiades, in an area with bad weather. Both sides immediately began to prepare the strike, but it would be the Americans that would get to lift off first. By 0925, 75 aircraft were already en route towards Hara's location. In contrast, only five minutes later, the 69 aircraft of the Japanese had managed to lift off. 
yet the American planes would find themselves in such horrible weather that they could only see the Shukaku. Yorktown's air group, led by Lieutenant Commander Oscar Peterson, was the first to arrive, but due to the bad weather, it could only score two hits on the carrier, starting some large fires in it. Lexington's air group then arrived, but scattered by the storms, their attack could only score one hit on the Shukaku, inflicting heavy damage, but overall losing five aircraft in return. Additionally, none of the torpedo bombers were effective during the entire attack, to the relief of the Japanese. Takahashi, on the other side, was far more successful. He was initially met by 18 Wildcats and 23 SBDs on patrol duty, yet the American planes failed to intercept the Japanese before they started their attack. Immediately, 18 torpedo bombers fell upon the carriers. Although the four that attacked Yorktown missed all of their shots, the 14 that attacked Lexington mounted an anvil attack and scored two clear hits on the port side. Successfully escorted by the Zeros, Tekahashi's dive bombers were the next to strike at the carriers. 19 bombers fell on Lexington, and despite the anti-aircraft fire, managed to hit the carrier twice, thus inflicting medium damage on her. 14 bombers also attacked Yorktown, but the good maneuvering of the carrier and the defensive actions of the Wildcats only allowed them to score one hit, which caused medium damage as well. All in all, Lexington had been badly mauled, but it appeared like she could continue sailing. The actions of the defenders, however, had shot down 13 enemy aircraft, while 19 more would have to be ditched or jettisoned due to the sustained damage. On the way back, Peterson's air group also shot down two additional Japanese planes, including that of Takahashi. This totaled the loss of around 87 aircraft for the Japanese, added to that of the Shoho. In comparison, the Americans lost 69 aircraft, plus the Nyosho and the Sims, although these two could be easily replaced. Yet the damage done by the torpedoes on Lexington would prove to be fatal a couple of hours later. As Fletcher was retreating south and Hara was retreating north, three explosions occurred on the carrier that caused large fires and forced the Americans to abandon the ship. Although this was a heavy loss, it was still unknown to the Japanese, and with the failure of Hara to totally destroy the enemy, Inoue had no other choice but to declare the end of Operation MO. Thus, the seaplane base at Des Moines Island was evacuated by May 12th, and the invasion convoy returned to Rabaul. On May 10th, Takagi and the Zuikaku tried again to search and destroy the enemy force, but they were long gone. The loss of one aircraft carrier was critical for the Americans, but they had achieved a tremendous strategic victory and had stopped the Japanese advance on New Guinea. As we'll see, their success during this battle would directly lead up to the important victory at Midway. While the Americans had suffered a key loss with the destruction of the carrier Lexington, the Japanese air and naval forces had also been badly mauled in the New Guinea region. The light aircraft carrier Shoho had been sunk, the carrier Shokaku had been damaged so badly that she had to head back to Truk for repairs, and the carrier Zuikaku had been crippled by its heavy amount of aircraft losses. For the Japanese, the postponement of the invasion of Port Moresby was annoying, but knowing that the Shokaku and Zuikaku would be unavailable for Operation MI was far more significant. They believed that they had at least sunk both American carriers on the Coral Sea, so the four Japanese carriers assigned for the operation had to be more than enough. Admiral Yamamoto was still rehearsing his desired invasion of Midway, and he was also planning to support it with a surprise attack against the Aleutians, aiming to divert the attention of the defenders and to neutralize the American air power in Alaska. As for the Allies, their codebreakers and cryptanalysts were hard at work and by the end of May, they knew the date, place and time of Operation MI, as well as the Japanese forces that were going to be involved. Admirals Nimitz and King immediately started to rush reinforcements to Midway, while also starting to draw plans for a trap that had the potential to deal a crushing blow to the IJN. Thus, a truly decisive engagement was brewing in the Pacific. Meanwhile, although the invasion of Port Moresby had been unsuccessful, Admiral Inoue approved the continuation of Operation RY, the planned invasion of Nauru and Ocean Islands. 
These two islands were very important for the Japanese due to their richness in phosphate, a resource mined for making fertilizers, ammunition, and explosives. A small invasion fleet under Admiral Shima, mainly built around the mine layer, Akinoshima, which had been assembled to invade Tulagi, departed Rabaul for a second time on May 11th to escort a small navy detachment of around 400 men towards Nauru. The operation was off to a bad start, as the Okinoshima was outright torpedoed by the American submarine S-42 while steaming off New Island. The mine layer suffered enormous damage from the attack and eventually capsized in St. George's Channel. Shima then moved his flag to the destroyer Yuzuki, and after depth charging the enemy submarine, he continued onwards towards his objective. But as we will recall from the Battle of the Coral Sea, Admiral Nimitz had sent all of their aircraft carriers to disrupt Operation MO. Whereas Admiral Fletcher's carriers had quickly arrived and engaged the Japanese invasion fleet, the two carriers under Admiral Halsey that had taken part in the Doolittle raid were now arriving in the area. Acting on the obtained intelligence about the planned Japanese invasion of Nauru, Nimitz directed Halsey to head towards Nauru as a feint to stop the Japanese operation. On May 15th, Japanese reconnaissance aircraft from Tulagi sighted the American force, and Nimitz's gamble proved to pay off, as Admiral Inoue had no other choice but to call back Shima's fleet, which lacked the air cover to safely conduct the operation. For a second time, Inoue's plans had been disrupted by the appearance of enemy carriers, and Operation RY would be postponed, just like the invasion of Port Moresby was. One of the more lesser-known weapons of World War II were the midget submarines, also known as mini-submarines. These typically were under 150 tons, crewed by very few submariners, and normally worked from motherships, from which they were launched and recovered. Italy famously used three of their Saluro Alenta Corsa during the raid of Alexandria on December 19, 1941, which placed limpet mines under the hulls of warships. Their attack killed eight crew, disabled two battleships, damaged one destroyer and one tanker. Germany developed its midget submarines late into World War II in an attempt to attack the Allied invasion of Europe and later disrupt supply lines with limited success. Britain specifically designed its X-craft to place timed explosive charges on seabeds underneath their targets. Britain famously used the X-craft during Operation Source, in which they made attacks on the Tirpitz, Scharnhorst and Lutzow based in Kafjord, Norway. Tirpitz was heavily damaged and its repairs would take over seven months. Unlike its British and Italian counterparts, the Japanese developed their midget submarines intending to employ them during fleet actions. In theory, they would have been launched from seaplane carriers to run amok through the enemy's fleet. This concept was later changed as a result of the emergence of carrier-supported aerial combat. As a result, the IJN changed the focus of their midget submarine program for infiltration and attacking of enemy vessels within harbors. What emerged was the Type A Kohyoteki class of midget submarines. In 1942, as the IJN were making preparations for their attack on Midway Island, they realized they would require diversionary attacks in the hopes of convincing the Allies that they were intending to attack to the south or west of their recent conquests. Six submarines of the IJN 8th Submarine Squadron made up an eastern attack group, led by Captain Hank Sasaki. There were four potential targets, Noumea, Suva, Auckland and Sydney. On June 8, 1942, both I-21 and I-29 dispatched their Yokosuka E-14Y1 Glen floatplanes for an aerial reconnaissance of various Australasian harbours to find the most vulnerable targets. Meanwhile, early on May 11th, I-22, I-24, I-27 and I-28 were ordered to pick up Kohyoteki-class midget submarines at the Japanese naval base at Truk in the Caroline Islands. I-28 was torpedoed on the surface and sunk by the US submarine USS Tautog en route to Truk on May 17th. The remaining submarines, outfitted with their midget submarines, left Truk on May 20th en route for the Solomon Islands. I-24 was forced to return a day later as her midget submarine's battery compartment blew up, 
killing the midget submarine's navigator and injuring the commander. Not a great start for the Japanese. Luckily, the midget submarine intended for I-28 replaced it. Earlier on May 16th, the I-21 and I-29 had been sent to make reconnaissance and to select targets for an attack. I-29 were sailing to Sydney when they ran into the Soviet merchant vessel Wellen, and on that evening fired upon her. The Wellen managed to escape with minimal damage, resulting in a scramble of anti-submarine ships from Sydney searching for the I-29. After 24 hours, they failed to find the submarine, prompting Rear Admiral Gerard Muirhead Gould, naval commander in charge of Sydney Harbour, to conclude the submarine was operating alone and had left the area. On May 23rd, I-29's float plane made a reconnaissance of Sydney, and despite Iron Cove's radar unit detecting the aircraft, they dismissed it as a glitch because there was no expected Allied aircraft operating over Sydney at the time. The reconnaissance reported the presence of two battleships or large cruisers, five large warships, several smaller warships, and numerous merchant shipping. The Allied Fleet Radio Unit of Melbourne Signals Intelligence Network partially intercepted the float plane's report and distributed it to Allied commanders by May 30th. Mirhead Gold allegedly did not react to the news. Just before dawn of May 29th, I-21's float plane, piloted by Ito Suzumu, performed a final reconnaissance flight over Sydney Harbour with the mission of mapping the location of major vessel targets and anti-submarine nets. Multiple observers spotted the float plane and wrongly assumed it to be a US Curtis Seagull. At 5.07 am, the Allies realized they had no aircraft airborne at the time and the RAAF base Richmond launched Wirraway fighters to locate the aircraft. They failed to locate the aircraft and alongside this, Frumel had intercepted more radio chatter between IJN submarines between May 26th and May 29th, indicating that a submarine or multiple submarines were approaching Sydney. Yet no significant defence measures were put into place at Sydney. By May 29th, the five Japanese submarines rendezvous 35 nautical miles northeast of the entrance to Sydney Harbour. On the night of May 31st, the I-27, I-22 and I-24 dispersed in an arc formation outside the harbour entrance before releasing their midget submarines. The Sydney Harbour defences consisted of eight anti-submarine indicator loops, six outside the harbour, one between North Head and South Head, and one between South Head and Middle Head. A partially constructed anti-submarine boom net was placed between George's Head on Middle Head and Lang Point on Inner South Head. The central section of the net was complete, but wide gaps remained on its sides. The harbour defence craft included anti-submarines HMAS Yandra and Bingera, auxiliary minesweepers HMAS Gunambi and Samuel Benbow, with numerous patrol boats armed with depth charges. Also in harbour was the heavy cruiser USS Chicago, HMAS Canberra, HMAS Adelaide, and multiple lesser warships. M14 was the first midget submarine launched at 5.20 pm, followed by M24 and M22 by 5.40 pm. M14 was detected passing the Middle South Heads loop at 8 pm, but the reading was dismissed due to heavy civilian traffic. Fifteen minutes later, a watchman spotted the M14 passing through the Western Gap as it collided with the pile light, reversed and trapped its stern in the net. The M14's bow proceeded to break the surface as the watchman rode towards it to determine what it was, then promptly rode to the nearby HMAS Yarima to report his finding. Yarima passed on the information to Sydney Naval HQ, but the report only got there by 9.52pm. HMAS Yarima and Lolita were sent to investigate, and upon confirming the object was a midget submarine, Lolita dropped two depth charges, both failing to detonate. Yarima requested permission from HQ to open fire as Lolita prepared a third depth charge, when at 10.35pm, the M14 activated its scuttling charges, killing the two men and destroying the M14's forward section. At this point, Mirhead Gould gave the order for general alarm, alerting the harbour that there might be other enemy submarines. 
M24 made its way into the harbour, grazing HMAS Fali, which reported the contact to command, but nothing was followed up. M24 crossed the indicator loop undetected at 9.48pm and followed a manly ferry through the anti-submarine net by 10pm. By 10.52pm, she was spotted by a searchlight of the moored USS Chicago, which immediately opened fire with its 5-inch guns and quadruple machine gun mounts. However, her weapons could not depress far enough and she inflicted only minimal damage. The senior officer present on USS Chicago gave orders to prepare for her departure and for the USS Perkins to begin anti-submarine screening around her. These orders were revoked by the skeptical Captain Howard Bode as he arrived on board at 11.30pm. You see that night, Muirhead Gould was hosting a party and one of the main guests was Captain Howard Bode. HMAS Wiala and Geelong began firing upon the M24 as it fled west towards Sydney Harbour Bridge, where at midnight it was able to submerge and escape. When M24 returned to periscope depth, she found herself west of Fort Denison and turned east. Meanwhile, at the same time USS Chicago had opened fire on M24, M21 slipped into the harbour and was spotted by patrol boat HMAS Loriana which illuminated her, sending an alert signal to HMAS Yandra. Yandra attempted to ram the M21 and then fired off six depth charges. It was assumed the submarine was destroyed, but M21 survived, most likely by taking refuge on the harbour floor. At 11.14, Mirhead Gould ordered all ships to observe blackout conditions and at 11.30 set off on a barge to inspect the boom net. The Admiral boarded Lolita at midnight and allegedly began to chastise the skipper and crew as he dismissed their reports. Junior officers recount a similar description of Bode's return to USS Chicago and both crews later claimed Mirhead Gould and Bode were heavily intoxicated. Despite the blackout order, Garden Island floodlights remained on until 12.25am. Around five minutes later, M24 fired two torpedoes, most likely at USS Chicago, but both missed. One torpedo passed close to USS Perkins's starboard bow, and the other continued underneath the KIX and HMAS Kittable, hitting the breakwater Kittable was tied up against. The explosion broke Kittable in two, sinking her and damaging KIX. 19 RAN and 2 RN sailors were killed, with 10 wounded. M24 proceeded to dive and tried to escape the harbour. The M24 never returned to her mother submarine. She was found in 2006 by seven amateur scuba divers around 3.1 miles off of Bungan Head. She had multiple bullet holes, suggesting USS Chicago's quadruple machine gun mount had mortally wounded her. Ships were ordered to make for open sea with USS Chicago leaving anchorage by 2.14 am. At 3 am, Chicago spotted a submarine periscope passing alongside her. It was the M21 trying to re-enter the harbour. At 3.50 am, HMS Canimbler fired upon the M21 in neutral bay, and at 5 am, HMAS Steady Hour, Sea Mist and Yarima spotted M21 around Taylor's Bay. Three patrol boats dropped depth charges, with Sea Mist scoring a direct hit. The blast damaged M21, which inverted and rose to the surface before sinking again. Sea Mist dropped a second depth charge, which inflicted damage on her own two engines, while Steady Hour and Yarima dropped 17 more depth charges. At some point during the night, the crew of M21 killed themselves. The five Japanese submarines waited off port hacking until June 3rd, abandoning hope of recovering any of the midget submarines. I-22 left the group to conduct reconnaissance operations at Wellington, Auckland and Suva, while the other four submarines began operations against Allied merchant shipping. I-24 patrolled south of Sydney, I-21 patrolled north of Sydney, I-27 patrolled off Gabo Island and I-29 patrolled Brisbane. I-24 managed to sink SS Iron Chieftain on June 3rd, I-27 sunk Iron Crown on June 4th, and I-21 sunk SS Guatemala on June 12th. 
I-21 would go on later to return to Australian waters to sink three more warships between January and February of 1943. I-24 bombarded Sydney on the morning of June 8th. Just after midnight, I-24 surfaced southeast of Macquarie Lighthouse and fired ten shells at Sydney Harbour Bridge. Nine of her shells landed in the eastern suburbs, with the last landing in the water. I-24 proceeded to crash dive to prevent the coastal artillery batteries from retaliating. USAAF pilot First Lieutenant George Cantello, based at Bankstown Airport, disobeyed orders and took off to try and find the source of the shelling, but his engine failed, causing his Ira Cobra to crash into a paddock at Hammondville, killing him. I-21 shelled Newcastle at 2.15am the same day, northeast of Stockton Beach, where she fired 34 shells, trying to hit the BHP steelworks. Her shells landed all over the city, causing minimal damage with no fatalities. Fort Scratchley returned fire, but I-21 escaped unscathed. In retrospect, the attack on Sydney Harbour was a failure for both sides. The Allies failed to respond repeatedly after several warnings of Japanese activity on the east coast of Australia prior to the attack, as we've mentioned. The performance of Mirhead Gould and that of Captain Howard Bode were also questionable on the night of the attack. The Japanese had lost all three midget submarines in exchange for the sinking of a single barracks ship. The preceding operations of the five Japanese submarines sank three merchant ships and caused minimal property damage during the two bombardments. The Japanese midget submarine attack on Sydney Harbour had no effect and tying up 11 fleet submarines for six weeks to support the attack on Sydney proved a waste of resources. It took several days before the 21 dead sailors aboard Kutabul could be recovered. On June 3rd, Mirhead Gould, alongside 200 Navy personnel, attended a burial ceremony for these sailors. The Australians also recovered the bodies of the four Japanese crew of the two midget submarines sunk in Sydney Harbour. In the hopes of improving the conditions of Australian POWs in Japanese internment camps, the Australians cremated the four Japanese bodies at Eastern Suburbs Crematorium, draped the Japanese flag over their coffins, and rendered them full naval honours. Mirhead Gould was criticised for this, but defended his actions based on respecting the courage of the four submariners. Japanese authorities noted the funeral service, but this did not lead to any significant improvement of conditions for Australian POWs. During the Pacific War, Japanese naval doctrine pursued guerre de scade, fleet versus fleet warfare, and thus submarines were mainly employed against warships. The IJN doctrine was built around the concept of fighting a single decisive battle, as was done at the Battle of Tsushima. They thought of their submarines as scouts, whose main role was to locate, shadow and attack Allied task forces. They did of course make some attacks on merchant shipping in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, as we've seen in this episode, but these were the vast minority of missions. The IJN's doctrine of guerre discada resulted in its submarines seldom posing a threat to Allied merchant shipping. By the end of the war, it is estimated the Japanese submarine fleet sank 184 merchant ships. In comparison, the Germans sank 2,840 merchant ships and the Americans 1,079. Japan lost roughly 2,117 merchant ships alongside almost 8 million tons of cargo. The submarine campaigns against merchant shipping are one of the least publicized feats in military history when it comes to the Pacific. By 1945, the Japanese merchant fleet was effectively destroyed. Japanese merchant ships served as the lifeblood of the empire, hauling in everything required for the nation's war effort, but also what it required to sustain its people. The Allied war against Japanese shipping led to the literal starvation of Japan, Ultimately, Japan's failure to reciprocate or hinder the war on merchant shipping would lead to its demise. Almost six months have passed since the devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor that gave birth to the Pacific War. In this half year, the Japanese Empire proved to be the one that was better prepared for war, and the one that held military superiority over its foes, 
as they rapidly steamrolled across the Pacific, capturing key points like Malaya, Burma, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, and the island of New Britain, putting high pressure on important countries like Australia and India, and even making a big power like the US feel threatened over a possible invasion. The Empire of the Rising Sun was at its zenith, but things would quickly go downhill from this point forward. The surprising and fierce Doolittle Raid, as well as the carrier battle at the Coral Sea, had shown the weaknesses of the Japanese, and this forced Admiral Yamamoto to seek a decisive battle with his main enemy. Yet, unbeknownst to him, he was sailing into a trap, a trap that would forever change the course of history. As we've previously covered, the origins of Operation MI take us back to the aftermath of the Doolittle Raid, which saw Admiral Yamamoto victorious in his efforts to advance into the Central Pacific, with the ultimate goal of seizing Hawaii and decisively defeating the American Pacific Fleet. Yet for this, he had to make a compromise to deliver two of his fleet carriers for the planned invasion of Port Moresby. In the resulting Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese ambitions were checked by the arrival of an American carrier force under Admiral Fletcher, which managed to leave the carriers Shokaku and Suikaku unable to be employed in the invasion of Midway. The cost, however, was also heavy for the Americans, as they lost the carrier Lexington, while the Yorktown suffered moderate damage and had to be repaired. On their estimates, the Japanese believed they had sunk both enemy carriers, so Yamamoto thought that his four remaining carriers of the Kido Butai would be more than enough to take Midway. But on the other side, American intelligence had successfully deciphered the Japanese plans of invasion. Admirals King and Nimitz knew when, how and where the invaders were going to conduct their offensive, even having at their disposal the possible strength to be employed by the enemy. Immediately, the American admirals started to reinforce Midway for the incoming battle, while also preparing an ambush that had the potential to cripple the IJN. Although King was adamant to employ the seven battleships that had survived the start of the war, Nimitz knew that the way to conduct naval warfare had changed with Pearl Harbor. His true striking power now lay with his aircraft carriers. In that regard, he sent the battleships towards the west coast, out of harm's way, while he endeavoured to have the Yorktown repaired as fast as possible. The other two carriers of Task Force 16, under Admiral Halsey, remained as his main force for the battle, along with the impressive 115 aircraft that had been jammed onto the island of Midway, which could provide him with the ability to have valuable reconnaissance over the enemy. Thus, Nimitz's carriers would be waiting under strict radio silence at Point Luck, a point 325 miles northeast of Midway, from where the Americans would launch an ambush intended to destroy half of the Japanese carrier force. This would be completely unexpected for Yamamoto, as he had envisioned to catch the Americans with their guard down and to achieve full surprise. First, he had planned to use Admiral Nagumo's carrier force to knock out Midway's air power with a surprise assault, reminiscent of that of Pearl Harbor. Then he would set up a seaplane base on Kure Island, while the invasion fleets advanced towards their objectives. A total of 5,000 SNLF Marines would land on Midway, while the Ichiki Detachment was to seize the Eastern Island, and a force of 1,500 Marines was to capture Sand Island. Yamamoto expected that the Americans would have the bulk of their naval forces on Hawaii, leaving the Japanese ample time to quickly capture their objectives, build bases on them, and carefully lay a trap of their own that was to completely knock the Pacific Fleet out of the war. For this trap, the Japanese admiral had dispersed his overwhelming forces, including a secondary attack against the Aleutians that had the objective of making the enemy think that the odds were in their favor. Once the Pacific Fleet appeared to recapture Midway, the dispersed Japanese vessels would converge on the island to strike at the American Navy. For Yamamoto, the Japanese battleships would play a key role in the battle, tasked with engaging the enemy battleships and delivering a final blow against them. 
A large number of submarines from the 6th Fleet were also to be employed on the route of the American advance from Pearl Harbor to Midway, with the intention to scout their strength and cause them great attrition. Yamamoto has been harshly criticized due to this overly complex plan, and he was completely wrong to expect full surprise and to disperse his overwhelming forces. For instance, Yamamoto had devoted a considerable fleet, led by Admiral Hosegaya, to execute the invasion of the Aleutians, which included a carrier strike on Dutch Harbour and landings on Kiska, Adak and Atu. These were clearly secondary objectives unworthy of the forces dedicated to seize them, leaving the invaders too far away to actually participate in any engagement at Midway. Furthermore, on May 27th, the operation was off to a bad start, as Nagamo's first Kido Batai departed Hashirajima anchorage one day later than scheduled. Even though this could jeopardize the entire initial strike at Midway, Yamamoto didn't see fit to make any adjustments to his plan. Unfortunately for him, Task Force 16 departed Pearl Harbor under strict radio silence the following day, with Yorktown doing the same. 72 hours later, she was in a battle-ready state, but her crews continued repairing her as she sortied. Although Nimitz had appointed Halsey to command the combined American forces, the senior admiral was in poor health due to a hard case of psoriasis, so the experienced Fletcher was given command of the defense of Midway, while Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance was put in charge of Task Force 16 out of a personal recommendation by Halsey himself. Upon assuming command, Fletcher launched 20 Dauntlesses to conduct reconnaissance, and he also moved his carriers to a new position 175 miles west of Point Luck. In contrast, Yamamoto's efforts to gather useful information over the enemy were also very lackluster, failing to execute a third attempt at Operation K due to the strong American presence at the French frigate shoals and having the 6th Fleet's submarines arriving late at their scheduled scouting cordon, through which the American carriers had already passed. On the morning of June 3rd, due to Nagamo's late departure, the first Japanese fleet started to arrive in the vicinity of Midway, rapidly getting spotted by American PBYs and suffering some aerial attacks that failed to do heavy damage to them. Luckily for the Japanese, Nagamo's carrier force finally arrived in the area from the northwest and then started to launch 108 aircraft, led by Lieutenant Commander Tomonaga Joichi, to strike at Midway during the early hours of June 4th. Although Yamamoto had hoped to achieve full surprise, Captain Cyril Simard, the commander of the Midway garrison, had earlier sent an air patrol and 22 PBYs for search operations. This resulted in the interception of the Japanese force some 30 miles from Midway by six Wildcats and 18 F-2A Buffaloes, piloted by brave US Marines. Yet the ensuing air battle turned out to be a disaster for the defenders, losing 15 planes in the struggle and only shooting down two Zeros, due to the large superiority of the battle-hardened Japanese pilots. Tomonaga would then go on to strike targets on Eastern and Sand Islands, heavily damaging support facilities there, but receiving much damage in return from anti-aircraft fire. By the end of the attack, the Japanese had failed to neutralize most of Midway's defenses and had also lost some 25 planes, which forced Tomonaga to request a second wave to complete the job. Losses were particularly heavy on the carrier Hiryu, leaving it with only eight torpedo bombers out of the 18 that it originally carried. While the Japanese attack was happening, another important event was taking place. During the early morning, the PBYs flying from Midway managed to spot two of Nagamo's carriers and alert Fletcher of their presence in the area. This was tremendously important, as whoever could attack the other carrier force first would have the upper hand in the battle. Whereas the Americans had wisely dedicated considerable resources for reconnaissance, Negimo only devoted a total of seven aircraft to fly to a range of 300 miles. After receiving the reports of the PBYs, Fletcher ordered Spruance's carriers to head south and strike at the enemy. The reason Yorktown's aircraft were reserved was because Fletcher was still unsure about the location of the remaining two Japanese carriers. At 0700, Spruance began the launch of his 116 aircraft. 
Although Hornet's planes quickly got into the air, Enterprise's launch didn't go exactly as planned, as their second deck load ended up delaying its liftoff, thus causing there to be two separate groups from the same carrier. Meanwhile, a wave of six TBF Avengers and four B-26 Marauders arrived from Midway to Nagamo's location and started to attack the carrier Akagi. The Japanese, however, had devoted 29 Zeros for air patrol, so the American aircraft were easy prey for the invaders. An hour later, the second wave under Major Lofton Henderson arrived and attacked the carrier Hiryu, but met the same fate as its predecessor. Half of the 16 dive bombers were shot down in the ensuing struggle, including that of Henderson. A third wave, consisting of 14 B-17s, and a fourth wave, consisting of 11 obsolete SB-2U-3s, then appeared, but yet again failed to score hits, with the loss of only three bombers. Around this time, Nagamo had also decided to prepare a second wave to attack Midway, using the aircraft that had been reserved to strike at the enemy carriers if they appeared. As he hadn't received any reports so far, he assumed that there weren't any enemy vessels in the area. Yet just as the strike group was being prepared, the Japanese reconnaissance got to detect a task force of at least 10 enemy ships in a stroke of luck. Upon receiving this fortuitous report, Nagamo suspended the second wave strike, but his next decision was a true dilemma for him. The so-called Nagamo's Dilemma left him two options. Strike immediately with the forces at hand to take initiative, conducting a piecemeal attack and risking some incoming aircraft from Midway requiring to ditch, or wait for the returning aircraft from Midway to launch a full strike wave, because IJN Doctrine did not endorse piecemeal attacks. He wasn't expecting the presence of enemy carriers so early on, and now most of his aircraft were not ready to execute a naval bombing. Although Rear Admiral Yamaguchi Tamon of the 2nd Carrier Division had called to launch an immediate strike, Nagimo decided to wait for confirmation that the enemy had carriers and did not take any action, instead hoping to quickly recover the first wave planes and thus giving the initiative to the Americans. In the meantime, Fletcher had also been alerted that his forces had been discovered by the enemy, so he decided to launch part of his aircraft in piecemeal attacks to support Spruance's strike against the 1st Kido Butai, which had departed almost two hours ago and was by now arriving at Nagamo's location. At 09.15, just as almost all the first wave planes had been recovered, the first 15 devastators started to appear on the horizon. These were Hornet's torpedo planes, which then fell upon the carrier Soyu, immediately getting engaged by the 18 Zeros that were on air patrol. In a matter of 20 minutes, all 15 Devastators were destroyed by the invaders, failing to hit any of the carriers, but preventing the Japanese from launching their own counter-strike. As the attack developed, Nagamo's carriers began to launch more and more fighters, which were running out of fuel to defend them. But now, 14 Devastators from Enterprise headed against the carrier Kaga. They were yet again prevented from striking their objectives by the Zeros, but at least five of them got to survive the engagement. Meanwhile, the rest of Hornet's strike force had passed well north of the first Kido Batai, having been given bad coordinates for the attack. They would never locate the enemy and would have to return to their carrier or to Midway, with a few fighters getting ditched on the way due to low fuel. Luckily, Enterprise's dive bombers, led by Lieutenant Commander Clarence McCluskey, managed to locate the Japanese vessels through an indirect route, in spite of the bad coordinates. As they were arriving, so was Yorktown's air group, which had advanced on a direct route towards the enemy. Facing 41 Zeros on patrol, Yorktown's torpedo bombers, with an escort of six Wildcats, began their approach towards the Japanese carriers at 10.10. Most of the enemy fighters were drawn towards the Wildcats, resulting in a series of dogfights at low altitude that gave the 12 Devastators of Lieutenant Commander Lance Massey the opportunity to launch a deadly attack over the carrier Hiryu. At the same time, with most of the Zeros distracted with the pursuit of Yorktown's torpedo bombers, McCluskey's and Yorktown's bombers managed to get close unnoticed and started to drop their bombs over the carrier Soyu and Kaga. By 10.25, four bombs managed to hit Kaga, while three hits were scored on Soyu, 
causing extensive damage on them and lighting up an inferno over the carriers. Seeing that Akagi might survive the attack unscathed, Lieutenant Richard Best and two bombers from Yorktown aborted their dives on Kaga and struck Akagi's port side with full surprise. Best himself managed to score a hit on the aft edge of the middle elevator, penetrating the upper hangar and causing a huge explosion among the fueled aircraft. Between 10.35 and 10.45, the last of the strikes was carried out by Massey's devastators, getting to launch torpedoes against Hiryu, but failing to hit the carrier. With the end of the attack, the Americans had lost a total of 67 aircraft, but had destroyed 14 Zeros and inflicted mortal damage on three carriers. Soyu and Kaga sunk that afternoon, with the loss of 1,522 lives, but Akagi took the longest to die. With a shocked Nagamo, who refused to leave his flagship, the carrier had to be abandoned eventually, then getting scuttled the next morning by orders of Yamamoto himself. Admiral Yamaguchi, in command of the last remaining carrier, immediately received orders to launch a counter-strike after the departure of the Americans. Mustering 36 aircraft under Lieutenant Kobayashi Michio, reinforced with 27 Zeros that were on patrol, the strike group was launched at 10.50. Meanwhile, Yamamoto and Kondo's fleet started to advance eastwards to support Nagamo, who upon getting to the cruiser Nagara, had decided to turn north to intercept the American vessels with his surface units. At 11.55, Kobayashi spotted Task Force 17 and began his attack on Yorktown. Yet his fighter escort was miles behind, so when five Wildcats emerged to intercept them, the Japanese formation was shattered. Only seven of Kobayashi's bombers managed to survive the interception, then approaching Yorktown from two directions. In the resulting strike, the experienced Japanese pilots expertly maneuvered around the enemy carrier and managed to strike three hits and two near misses, starting large fires all over Yorktown in one of the most accurate attacks of the war. Although the Japanese had lost 13 of their bombers, Yorktown had come to a stop and looked like it had received mortal damage, so Fletcher decided to move to the cruiser Astoria, while Spruance sent a small force to support the burning carrier. Upon getting notified of the successful strike by Kobayashi, Admiral Yamaguchi decided to commit his few remaining aircraft, the ones that had retreated from the midway attack with many casualties, for a second assault against the Americans. Led again by Tomonaga, the makeshift force of 16 aircraft was launched by 1330 when Kobayashi's group was recovered. At this point, Yorktown's fires had been put out and the boilers had been restored. So when Tomonaga got sight of Task Force 17 at 1430, he didn't know he was attacking the same carriers Kobayashi had attacked hours ago. The Japanese were met by six Wildcats on patrol, with eight more coming to reinforce them from Task Force 16. This time, however, the Zero escorts were used effectively, giving Tomonaga's five torpedo bombers the chance to dive against Yorktown. Flying a damaged plane, Tomonaga himself was the first to dive in, getting flamed by the defenders, but managing to maintain control of his burning bomber to make an excellent torpedo drop. Unfortunately, his torpedoes missed, as did his other wingmen's shots, so the sacrifice of the five torpedo planes would go unrewarded. But then entered the second five torpedo bombers of the invaders, surviving several attacks by Wildcats to launch four torpedoes against Yorktown. Two of these torpedoes hit the port side of the carrier, causing Yorktown to halt and list with a devastating effect. The five torpedo planes would go on to survive the struggle and return to Hiryu with four of their escorts. While the Americans, having lost four Wildcats, prepared to abandon the listing carrier. While this attack was happening, American aircraft spotted Nagamo's forces coming towards Task Force 16. At 15.30, Spruance launched Enterprise's 25 Dauntlesses, led by Lieutenant Wilma Gallagher, to finish off the last Japanese carrier. While preparing a third strike for the afternoon, Yamaguchi was taken by surprise by the appearance of American aircraft at 1700. With the 13 Zeros on patrol outnumbered, Gallagher's bombers began to dive against Hiryu just five minutes later. Although they lost three Dauntlesses, four hits were achieved against the carrier, 
penetrating the hangar deck and setting Hiryu aflame. In the old tradition, Yamaguchi decided to go down and perish with his ship, while the rest of the crew was evacuated. He was arguably the best carrier officer of the IJN, making it a huge loss. 31 dive bombers from Hornet then appeared, heading to attack targets of opportunity but failing to hit any. With the last attack of June 4th concluded, Yamamoto still hoped to salvage the situation and achieve a decisive victory. He replaced Nagamo for Kondo due to his failure, and ordered the second Kido Butai to come south and sent the submarine I-168 to shell Midway. But the second Kido Butai couldn't start to move until June 5th, thus leaving the Japanese forces in a vulnerable position and forcing Yamamoto to order the final cancellation of Operation MI during the early hours of June 5th. Furthermore, upon assuming command of the American forces, Sperance had expertly avoided getting lured into any surface engagement, which was what Yamamoto was trying to do off Wake Island. By midday, Sperance managed to launch strikes against the retreating Japanese forces, but could only find the destroyer Tanikaze, which shot down four aircraft and expertly avoided getting damaged. Additionally, Admiral Kurita's four cruisers were left very exposed and suffered an accident while trying to evade an American submarine. After surviving an attack by Midway's aircraft, the cruisers Mogami and Mukuna suffered a new strike by Esperance's forces. The damaged Mogami was hit twice, while Mikuna received five direct hits and soon sank into the ocean. After suffering one more hit, the heavily damaged Mogami managed to escape and rendezvous with Kondo the next day. Meanwhile, salvaging efforts were being conducted on Yorktown, and it appeared like the carrier could be successfully salvaged. Yet the sudden appearance of submarine I-168 finally killed Yorktown, hitting her with two torpedoes and also ripping apart the destroyer Haman with another torpedo hit. At 0500 on June 6th, the carrier finally sank into its final slumber. Nonetheless, the battle had been a huge success for the Americans, only suffering the loss of some 144 aircraft on top of the vessels recently described. In turn, the Japanese had lost all four of their carriers and the cruiser Mikuna, as well as some 248 aircraft. Nimitz's gamble had been successful, and it would take a long time for the Japanese to recover from these losses. With their carrier force crippled, the Japanese would lose the initiative in the war, and now it was time for the Americans to go on the offensive. Since the early planning of the Pacific War, Alaska, and the Aleutian Islands in particular, were seen as important staging grounds for dangerous invasion prospects, both by Japanese and American strategists. As we'll recall, the 1922 Washington Naval Treaty banned military bases and fortifications all across the Pacific, including both the Kuril Islands and the Western Aleutians in the North Pacific. This had left the American northern flank extremely vulnerable, with people in the US believing that Alaska could be taken almost overnight by a hostile force. By 1940, with the threat of war with Japan looming on the horizon, the American government had begun efforts to fortify and reinforce Alaska with the allocation of $350 million for defense, the arrival of the 4th Regiment, and the construction of military bases across the territory. Under the leadership of Lieutenant General John DeWitt, the Western Defense Command would be established to protect the Pacific Coast, nominating the unorthodox Colonel Simon Buckner Jr. to command the defense of Alaska. Buckner's main priority was to construct an adequate air force, and as such, he began to illegally build airfields in the Aleutians via funds he had embezzled. He would succeed, and by the start of the war, the now Major General Buckner had five operational airfields and some 22,000 army personnel. In the meantime, the Alaskan Navy was assigned a small force of World War I-era destroyers, requisitioned Coast Guard cutters, and S-boat submarines, while a small force of outdated P-36 Hawks, short-in-range P-40 Warhawks, and obsolete B-18 Bolos was delivered to the Alaskan Air Force. Within months of Pearl Harbor, however, the hard-working Buckner now boasted 14 operational military bases and 30 operable airfields, supporting 45,000 army personnel, four infantry regiments, 
three Coast Artillery regiments and a tank company. Additionally, Brigadier General William Butler was put in command of the recently established 11th Air Force, consisting of some 95 fighters and 46 bombers. As for the Japanese, as we've already seen, Admiral Yamamoto had decided to launch an invasion of the Aleutians and a strike at Dutch Harbour that was going to be executed concurrently with the invasion of Midway. Operation AL was thus assigned to an overwhelming naval force under Admiral Hosogaya of the 5th Fleet, divided into several smaller forces that included the 2nd Kido Batai of Rear Admiral Kakuta Kakuji, two invasion fleets mainly built around light cruisers and destroyers, a submarine detachment, a seaplane tender force, Hosogaya's main fleet built around the heavy cruiser Nachi, and a distant covering force under Vice Admiral Takasu Shiro. We've previously said that this operation was used by Yamamoto to disperse his forces, in that regard giving the Americans the notion that they were not going to be terribly overwhelmed if they chose to meet the Japanese in battle at Midway. But the Aleutians also held another valuable purpose. They could cover the northern flank of Midway once it was taken, and could also completely shield Japan from any future American strike similar to that of the Doolittle Raid. At least, this is what modern historians believe nowadays, since in the past, historians tended to portray the operation as a feint to lure the American carriers away from Midway. Just as it had been done with Operation MI, American cryptanalysts and codebreakers had deciphered the Japanese plans for an offensive against the Aleutians, concluding it was a diversion from the main attack against Midway. Admiral Nimitz then decided accordingly to leave Aleutian defense to the local Alaskan forces, while the bulk of the Pacific Fleet was directed to ambush the enemy at Midway. Yet he ended up sending Rear Admiral Robert Theobald's Task Force 8 out of a personal recommendation from Admiral King. Built around two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and a variety of destroyers, submarines, and other naval units, Task Force 8 had the mission to defend the North Pacific area to which it arrived on May 27th. Theobald and Buckner would have to work side by side to oppose the Japanese landings and to reverse the gains achieved by the enemy. By May 25th, Hosogaya's northern force had been assembled at the Ominato naval base, departing towards its objectives one day later. The Japanese would invade Kiska Island with 1,260 SNLF marines while the North Seas Detachment of Major Hazumi Matsutoshi, consisting of 1,200 troops of the 301st Independent Battalion, was charged with the occupation of the islands of Atu and Edek. At this point, American intelligence had successfully identified Kiska and Atu as the first objectives of the invasion, yet Admiral Theobald disregarded this information, believing these islands were too worthless to warrant an invasion, and therefore choosing to defend Dutch Harbour instead. He then departed Kodiak on June 1st, heading to a position 500 miles east of Unalaska, although he was unable to do much due to the strict radio silence imposed for the Battle of Midway. By the night of June 2nd, Kakuta's carriers had gotten to their launch point, 165 miles south of Dutch Harbour. They had been concealed by the dense fog of the Pacific coast under a cold weather of around minus 13 Celsius. On June 3rd, eight minutes before the northern summer's local sunrise, Kakita had decided to launch his strike with some 46 aircraft, led by Lieutenant Abe Zenji, yet he was still worried that his pilots might not know how to return to their carriers due to the heavy weather. Prevented by the thick fog from flying in formation, the planes had to make their individual way towards their objective but their flight was suddenly stopped when experienced Abe, who had taken part in the strikes at Pearl Harbor and the Indian Ocean, detected that the overcast was too low for effective dive bombing. Thus, 15 dive bombers and 11 Zeros aborted the strike, leaving only 19 aircraft under the command of Lieutenant Samajima Hiroichi to execute the attack on Dutch Harbor. The Japanese were expecting almost no resistance, yet to their surprise, they would be met by US fighters from Cold Bay and by several coastal artillery batteries. Furthermore, the defenders had been expecting a strike for several days, so they duly went to general quarters an hour before the detection of the Japanese aircraft, which was carried out by the seaplane tender Gillis around 0540. 
Five minutes later, the Zeros finally appeared and made a strafing pass of Dutch Harbour's facilities, destroying one PBY Catalina that was trying to get in the air. Immediately, anti-aircraft fire erupted from the coastal artillery and from the vessels in the harbour, yet they couldn't prevent the enemy bombers from dropping their deadly load over Fort Mears's installations. Sixteen bombs managed to destroy three warehouses, two barracks and three Quonset huts, while the next six drops were accidentally delivered over Mount Ballyhoo without achieving much damage. The following six bombs knocked out a radio transmitter and destroyed another Quonset hut, and the final six drops hit a fire watcher's bunker, an army truck and some naval facilities at Powerhouse Hill. All in all, only superficial damage had been achieved, and the vessels at harbour, although detected, hadn't been damaged. With this strike over, Samajima led his torpedo bombers northwards, missing the appearance of Cold Bay's Warhawks by 10 minutes. Upon learning that there were destroyers at Dutch Harbour, Kakuta decided to dispatch a second wave of 33 aircraft to destroy these ships. But the immense coldness of the weather iced up the plane's carburetors, forcing them to return to their carriers. Additionally, four Type 97 EA-10 float planes from the cruisers Mayer and Takao were launched, but they were discovered by Umnak's Warhawks and suffered two losses in the struggle. In the following hours, Kakuta's carriers were spotted by two PBYs, yet their transmissions didn't reach Dutch Harbour and they were quickly shot down. The Japanese Admiral now had to turn southeast to support the invasion of Adak, but he was disappointed with his Dutch Harbour strike and ended up deciding to launch a second attack instead. On the morning of June 4th, however, this time two PBYs would get to actually report Kakuta's location before getting destroyed. Six Marauder bombers from Umnak and six from Cold Bay were launched to strike at the Japanese carriers, but they were thwarted by the heavy fog and had to abort. Only one B-26, under Captain George Thornborough, kept on and managed to find the enemy, but he was shot down without achieving any hits. In the afternoon, two B-17s and Captain Robert Meals's marauders from Umnak also managed to find Kakuta's carriers, though their attacks were very unsuccessful as well. At 1600, all preparations were finally ready, and Kakuta was at last able to launch his second strike on Dutch Harbour with some 30 aircraft under the command of Lieutenant Abe. By 1740, the Japanese planes started to appear on the horizon and got to destroy one PBY that was intercepted on their route. Just 15 minutes later, Abe's dive bombers began to attack Dutch Harbour's facilities, managing to destroy four brand new 6,666 barrel steel fuel tanks, some 22,000 barrels of fuel, and the merchantman Northwestern. This attack was followed by Lieutenant Masataki Yamagami's torpedo bombers, which blew a hole in the top of the seaplane hangar at Mount Ballyhoo, destroyed an anti-aircraft gun, and severely damaged an ammunition store before departing around 1830. At this point, some Warhawks from Port Glen had come to meet them, resulting in a struggle that ended with one Japanese dive bomber and two P-40s destroyed. Concurrent to the second attack on Dutch Harbour, the Battle of Midway had developed unfavourably for the Japanese, resulting in the almost complete destruction of the first Kido Batai. Alarmed about his failure to decisively defeat the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Yamamoto had ordered the second Kido Batai southwards to join the carrier Hiryu in its final efforts to destroy the American forces. But Kakuta was already committed in his strike on Dutch Harbour, knowing full well that his carriers had to refuel and that they couldn't get to the battlefield quickly enough. After conducting a successful refueling during the night, Kakuta's second Kido Batai commenced its travel southwards on the morning of June 5th, but they would be promptly stopped by Yamamoto, who by now had realized that the Midway disaster was unsalvageable. While the Japanese forces retreated and Kakuta advanced to rendezvous with Hosogaya's fleet, Theobald and Butler decided to launch a worthless scouting operation over the empty Bering Sea, believing that an invasion of Dutch harbor was imminent. With the American airbase at Umnak revealed, the invasion of the nearby Adak Island was also discarded, Yet Yamamoto decided to go on with the invasions of Kiska and Atu anyway. On the night of June 6th, 
the 1,260 SNLF Marines of Commander Mukai Nifumi were put ashore at Kiska's Rinard Cove and rapidly managed to advance south towards the harbour. By 02.15 on June 7th, the 10 American sailors deployed at a weather station on Kiska Harbour were startled awake by the overwhelming attack of the Japanese forces. Eight of them managed to escape into the mountainside and survived for a couple of days under dastardly cold weather, but in the end they eventually had to surrender. At the same time that the Japanese were capturing Kiska, Major Hazumi's North Seas detachment was landing at Holtz Bay. They faced no resistance, only the difficult task of climbing the snow-covered Holtz Bay Chichagov Harbour Pass, and soon the island was taken and its 44 inhabitants were turned into war prisoners. With Operation AL concluded, Yamamoto dispatched a strong fleet to support Kakuta and the Japanese forces at the Aleutians. Meanwhile, with the Battle of Midway also over, Admiral Nimitz had decided to refit the aircraft of Admiral Speranz's Task Force 16 and then sent them northward to hunt down the second Kido Batai. But just as Speranz had gotten halfway to his objective, the American reconnaissance managed to discover the Japanese presence on the islands of Kiska and Etu. Nimitz feared that the Japanese land-based aircraft could be waiting for the American carriers, so he decided to recall Speranz's task force and not risk getting into a possible enemy trap. The Japanese then began to turn the islands of Kiska and Atu into their major bastions in the North Pacific, bringing a wide array of aircraft, midget submarines, coastal defense and anti-aircraft guns. In response, the Americans decided to evacuate the Western Aleutians, interning some 881 native Aleuts in relocation camps in southeastern Alaska and burning their villages to the ground so the enemy could not use them for shelter. Although the Midway operation had been a disaster, with the full extent of it being concealed from the public, the Japanese had managed to secure a foothold in North America, something that caused great concern amongst the American population. But as Buckner said, having in mind the hostility of both the unforgiving terrain and of the staunch American defenders, if the Japanese come they may get a foothold, but it will be their children who get as far as Anchorage and their grandchildren who will make it to the States, and by then they'll all be American citizens anyway. With the Japanese fortifying their newly conquered islands, Buckner, Theobald and Butler wouldn't sit idly by either. A grim, long-range air-sea war of attrition would thus begin, lasting for some 11 months, in which the US was in no position to launch a major offensive and recapture the Aleutians. Fittingly dubbed the Thousand Mile War, the Americans would launch approximately a dozen different air raids over Kiska in the month of June alone, including the three-day Kiska Blitz. Furthermore, on June 20th, American intelligence detected Kakuta's carrier force re-entering the Bering Sea and believed that it was a renewed invasion of Alaska. This prompted the execution of Operation Bingo, the first mass airlift in US history, in which 140 cargo planes worth of reinforcements were brought to Alaska through 46 seized civilian aircraft. Although Buckner wasn't ready yet to recapture his lost territories, he had now been sufficiently reinforced to completely hold Alaska against any force that the Japanese could throw at him. Yet the Aleutian Islands were not the only territories in North America to be attacked by Japan. About a week after the attack on Pearl Harbor, nine submarines of the Japanese 6th Fleet arrived off the North American Pacific coast. They were tasked with performing reconnaissance and disrupting shipping lanes. Some of these submarines would go a step further and carry out attacks on the mainland of North America. On December 10th, the Japanese learned that an American Lexington-class carrier was heading for the US mainland and sent 9 out of 12 submarines operating around Hawaii to pursue and sink the enemy carrier. After a stressful four days, the search proved fruitless. Afterwards, a new role was established for the submarines. They were to take up positions at designated sites off the Pacific coast and begin attacking Allied merchant shipping. Vice Admiral Mitsumi Shimizu, commander of the Japanese submarine forces, would direct Rear Admiral Satomu Sato on his flagship I-9 for the operations. These nine submarines had a range of approximately 15,000 miles, 
and a surface speed of around 23 knots, armed with up to 18 torpedoes and 5.5-inch deck guns. An hour before dawn on December 18th, the I-17 attacks the US freighter Samoa, which was carrying lumber to San Diego. The I-17 fired five times upon her with her 5.5-inch guns, doing light damage, and at a distance of 70 feet, shot one torpedo, which passed under the Samoa, missing. Luckily for the Samoa, the torpedo's explosion made the Japanese think she was hit and sinking, so they submerged and left the scene, allowing the Samoa to escape to San Diego. On December 20th, the I-17 found the Sakoni Vacuum Oil Company's tanker, Amidio, 20 miles off the coast of Cape Mendocino. Captain Clark Farrow of the Amidio, upon discovering the I-17 a quarter mile to his stern, sent an SOS as he tried to outrun the raider, but was rapidly overtaken at 20 knots. The I-17 opened fire with its deck gun, with the first shot taking out the Amidio's radio antenna. Two more shots struck into the Amidio's hull as the ship hoisted a white flag and the crew took to its lifeboats. One of the salvos hit a lifeboat carrying three crewmen, who fell into the water and would drown as a result of choppy seas. Five shots in total would hit the Amidio before the I-17 would suddenly submerge as two US bombers had arrived, responding to the SOS sent out 15 minutes prior. The two bombers dropped depth charges before leaving. After the planes left, the I-17 resurfaced and launched a torpedo, hitting the Amidio in her stern, passing through her engine room and killing two crewmen, before the I-17 would submerge and flee the scene. The Amidio drifted until it ran aground off the rocks of Crescent City in early January 1942. At about the same time Amidio was attacked, the I-23 was stalking the US tanker SS Agriworld, 20 miles off Cyprus Point near Santa Cruz. At 2.15pm, an explosion off the stern of the ship alerted the captain, Frederick Gonsalves, to run for the bridge. 500 yards away, the I-23 tried to get broadside of the frantically zigzagging tanker, but was unable to outmaneuver her while simultaneously firing. The I-23 shot eight shells as the tanker neared land, missing her, and submerged in failure. On the morning of December 22nd, the Standard Oil Company tank, SSHM Story, was 55 miles north of Santa Barbara as the I-19, commanded by Captain Narahara Sego, stalked her for over an hour. When the HM Story was two miles off Point Aguelo, the I-19 shot three torpedoes, missing her with each. A US Navy plane saw her and began to drop depth charges, forcing the I-19 to submerge and flee the scene. At 5.30 a.m. on December 23rd, the SS Montebello, sailing from Port San Luis bound for Vancouver, was hit amidship by a torpedo launched from I-21, luckily hitting the only compartment not loaded with gasoline. The crew was forced to abandon ship as the I-21 began to shell them at point-blank range. As 36 men in four lifeboats began rowing for safety, the I-21 opened fire with machine guns on the helpless sailors, but luckily for them, visibility was quite poor and no one was wounded. On the morning of December 24th, the lumber schooner Barbara Olsen was sailing for San Diego when she was rocked by an explosion 100 feet off her seaward side. None of her crew would know what caused the explosion, but it was a torpedo launched from I-19. The torpedo had gone under her and blown up on the other side. Four hours later, the I-19 was a few miles north off Point Fermin, where it found the freighter SS Absaroka entering the Catalina Channel. The I-19 shot two torpedoes, with one striking 50 feet aft of the beam, sending lumber into the air and killing a man. Though she was injured and tilting, she did not sink, but instead managed to beach herself off Port MacArthur. The I-9 left the west coast for Panama on December the 20th, and as a planned finale to the seven days of attacking the west coast shipping, the eight remaining submarines were to make attacks on Christmas Day. They would select a choice of mainland targets to fire 30 rounds each from their deck guns at and then withdraw to the Marshall Islands. However, on December 22nd, an unexpected order was received 
postponing the attack to December 27th from Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto wanted to avoid attacking during the Christian festival out of fear of offending their German and Italian allies. There was also a fear of American reprisal attacks. Five days later, the rear admiral, Tsutomu Sato, on the flagship I-9, notified headquarters the submarine force was low on fuel and this would complicate the return to Japan, so Yamamoto called off the attack altogether. Despite the order, one submarine, the I-15, lingering around the Farallon Islands, decided to do something daring. Before departing like the rest, Captain Ishikawa Nobuo fired at least one torpedo at the Golden Gate Bridge. Fortunately, it ended up missing its target and embedded in a sandbank of Marshall's Beach, and was found later in 1946. After the submarine attacks of December 1941, US coastal defenses were strengthened. On February 23, 1942, the first Axis ship would shell the US mainland. At 7.07 pm, while Franklin D. Roosevelt was commencing a fireside chat, the I-17, captained by Nishino Kozo, stopped right beside Elwood Richfield Oil Company refinery. The I-17 proceeded to fire the first of 17 rounds, aimed at the Richfield aviation fuel tank stored behind the beach. Most of the shells fell into the water, overshot the target, or landed as duds. By 7.35, assuming the Americans would be hot on his tail, Nishino fired his last round and retreated. The attack only did slight damage, but caused immense panic, as mainland America had been attacked. Local residents of Elwood jumped into their cars and drove madly inland, trying to escape a potential invasion. Captain Hagen and a master sergeant were sent to the refinery to defuse the dud rounds, and one detonated, sending shrapnel to hit Hagen. Hagen would be America's only assigned service member to receive a Purple Heart for a wound received by enemy attack on American soil. The submarine attacks of December had caused the US to increase its coastal defenses and the American people's paranoia of possible attacks. When the Elwood oil field was shelled by I-17, it set in a hysteria. On February 24th, the Office of Naval Intelligence issued a warning that an attack on mainland California could be expected within the next 10 hours. At around midnight, a report was sent out to anti-aircraft batteries on the heights overlooking the Los Angeles area that enemy planes had been spotted. Air raid sirens began to sound off at 2.25 am throughout Los Angeles County, and a total blackout was ordered as thousands of air raid wardens rushed to their positions. At 3.16 am, the 37th Coast Artillery Brigade began firing their 50 caliber machine guns and 12.8-pound anti-aircraft shells into the air. Over 1,400 shells were fired sporadically until 4.14 am. Several buildings and vehicles were damaged by shell fragments, with five indirect civilian deaths. This became known as the infamous Battle of Los Angeles, and in 1983, the Air Force reported the entire event was attributed to the sighting of a runaway weather balloon and war panic. On June 7th, the I-26, after taking part in the opening stages of the Aleutian Islands campaign, began to stalk the SS Coast Trader as it left the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The I-26 fired a torpedo, hitting the Coast Trader in her starboard side, flooding her quickly. Then the I-26 turned her attention to a new enemy, Canada. At around 10pm on June 20th, the I-26 was patrolling the coast of British Columbia when it surfaced two miles off the Estevan Point lighthouse. The I-26 began to open fire with its deck gun. This was the first direct attack on Canadian territory since the Fenian raids of the 1860s. RM Lally, the lightkeeper at Estevan Point, heard the salvos crashing into the surf below and hurried down the spiral staircase to warn his wife to take cover before he doused the light. A veteran of the Great War, he stayed to observe the shelling. Fortunately, the I-26 missed over 17 shots against the lighthouse. Although the I-26 failed to hit its target, the aftermath caused a disproportionate effect on coastal shipping, 
as all lighthouses along the coast were extinguished in fear of their use by the enemy. Near where the Columbia empties into the Pacific Ocean stands Fort Stevens, an American military installation built near the end of the American Civil War. By 1941, it held 10-inch coastal defense guns, antiques left over from World War I, two 12-inch mortars, and a few 6-inch disappearing guns. The fort was manned by the Oregon Army National Guard's 249th Coast Artillery Battalion, led by Lt. Col. Lifton M. Irwin and the 18th Coast Artillery. On June 21st, just before midnight, the I-25, captained by Meiji Tagami, had been following some fishing boats to avoid minefields in the area, when it surfaced at the mouth of the Columbia River and began to fire 17 rounds from its deck gun in the direction of Fort Stevens. Tagami expected immediate return fire, so he ordered his gun crew to fire as quickly as possible without bothering to aim properly. Lieutenant Colonel Lifton M. Irwin ordered an immediate blackout of the fort and refused to permit his men to return fire, which would have revealed their positions. Some of the shells landed in a nearby baseball field, destroying its backstop. One shell landed close to Battery Russell, another next to a concrete pillbox and one severed several large telephone cables. The I-25 made a hasty escape after doing little to no damage, but the attack on Fort Stevens, along with the Aleutian Islands campaign, helped create the 1942 full-scale West Coast invasion scare. With so many operations doing minimal damage, one Japanese officer would try to step up to the challenge to strike at North America. Warrant Flying Officer Nobuo Fujita was aboard the I-25 during a deployment in the Aleutian Islands campaign. In the spring of 1942, he had flown above Kodiak Island at 9,000 feet and observed that the American response to an unidentified plane was complete indifference. This led Fujita to suggest an air raid against the American Pacific coast, utilizing a Yokosuka E-14Y Glen float plane. This particular plane was capable of being stored and launched from submarines to perform reconnaissance and small-scale bombing operations. The Glen had folding wings and was transported in a watertight capsule attached to the deck of a submarine such as the I-25. The proposal was endorsed by Prince Takamatsu, a younger brother of Emperor Hirohito, who was enticed by a Japanese official who had been previously assigned to the consulate in Seattle, Washington who mentioned that late summer was quite dry in the Pacific Northwest. Thus it was decided the air raid would drop incendiary bombs to ignite major forest fires. On August 14, 1942, the I-25 left to make what would be the final Japanese attack on the American coast and a reprisal for the Doolittle raid. On September 9th, after arriving off the Oregon coast, Fujita and his bombardier, Petty Officer Shoji Okuda, propelled off the I-25, carrying two 168-pound incendiary bombs. They flew 50 miles eastwards, passing over Cape Blanco. On Mount Emily Fire Tower in Siskiyou National Forest, Howard Raz Gardner spotted and reported the Glen. 50 miles inland, Fujita dropped the first bomb, and six miles farther, the second. Both bombs exploded, but the foliage was too damp from rain to allow for the fires to develop quickly. Fire Warden Gardner and USFS Fire Lookout Keith V. Johnson hiked to Wheeler Ridge, where there was a small fire emerging. Both men worked throughout the night to contain the fire, and by morning, an additional fire crew arrived to help. Fujita performed a second raid on September 29th in the same general locale. Fujita reasoned that no one would expect a repeat attack. He flew 90 minutes inland this time and let two bombs release over Grassy Knob near Port Orford, Oregon. However, even less came of these bombs as yet again wet foliage refused to start a wildfire. 20 years later, in 1962, Fujita was invited by the town of Brookings, just 10 miles due east from Wheeler Ridge. Assured by the Japanese government he would not face a war criminal trial, Fujita served as Grand Marshal for the local Azalea Festival. At the festival, 
Fujita presented his family's 400-year-old katana to the city as a symbol of his regret. Brookings treated him with respect and affection. He would go on to make additional visits to Brookings, serving as an informal ambassador of peace and friendship. In 1995, Fujita sponsored three students from Brookings Harbor High School to visit Japan. They would present him with a decutory letter from Ronald Reagan. Fujita would make a last few visits to Brookings, and in 1992, he planted a tree at the bomb site as a gesture of peace. A few days before his death, Fujita was made an honorary citizen of Brookings on September 30th, 1997, at the age of 85. In October of 1998, his daughter, Yoriko Asakura, buried some of his ashes at the bomb site. Though the Japanese started the war with a bang, successfully expanding their empire over the whole of Southeast Asia, completely crippling the US Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, and swiftly taking most of the American Pacific possessions, their defeats at the Coral Sea and Midway would lead directly to two of the most decisive campaigns of the Pacific War, Guadalcanal and the Cocota Track. Already we can see that the initiative was shifting to the side of the Allies, yet the Japanese were also prepared to fight to the last to persevere in the war. Nonetheless, time would eventually prove that a fight with the sleeping giant is not a fight you can win. But it is during this early period that enough time was gained for the Americans to heal their wounds and build an arsenal big enough to defeat the new overlords of Asia. And all of that thanks to the brave men and women who fought and died against overwhelming odds, against a Japanese behemoth that was at the height of its power, against an empire that was at the zenith of its glory. They could have cowered in defeat, yet they valiantly chose to stand up and eventually managed to turn the war around. But as it has been seen, this is only the beginning of their story, the beginning of the Pacific War. Thanks again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Get the game for free via our link in the description. More long-form videos and more videos on the Pacific War are on the way, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.